Hello everybody and welcome to the 10th research seminar of the European Palliative Care Research Center PRC with the seminar title Models of Integrated Oncology and Palliative Care How to Optimize Symptom Management. We are for the very first time online and are happy to see that participants from all over the world are joining us. Singapore, China, USA, Brazil, Nigeria, Italy, Australia, Canada and many more. Welcome. My name is Tony Lundby. I'm the manager of PRC together with Stein Corsa and on behalf of the two of us, the scientific and planning committees and the head office at Oslo University Hospital, I would like to thank you all for attending. We are now live from the Norwegian Cancer Society's Science Center. The Norwegian Cancer Society is the main source of funding for PRC and has been so kind to support and co-organize this event. Many thanks. A special thanks also to the external members of the scientific committee, Evelyn Kulip, Chris Fissers, Paul Krebster, Karin van der Riet, and Per Sjögren, and to all our collaborators who are contributing to PRC in this event. Today we have an interesting and diverse program including end-of-life care, different models of integration of oncology and palliative care, and various topics on pain management. We'll also hear presentations of two selective abstracts. We received 13 abstracts this year. You can read them all online on our web page. We sincerely hope you will enjoy these two days and that you will be actively participating in the chat. Please feel free to comment and ask questions there throughout the seminar. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Stein Corsa, head of PRC, followed by Ingrid Stenstad Olvos, Secretary General of the Norwegian Cancer Society. Stein, the floor, or should I say the screen, is yours. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Stein Kosa. I'm the leader of uh, the PRC. And it's a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome uh, everyone here. Um, this is the 10th uh, seminar and uh, we are very happy that we actually can organize it because uh, because of the COVID. Uh, our plan was to have it in, in Holland. Unfortunately, we couldn't be there and now we are fortunately online and uh, as Tony said, uh, there are more than 350 people who have signed up for this two days uh, seminar. And I really hope that uh, we can uh, have a good uh, seminar that we can uh, have interesting debates and um, that you learn something uh, from uh, the conversations and from the excellent uh, programs. There are speakers from all over the world. Next slide, please. Uh, PRC's overall uh, objective uh, is to improve the scientific evidence base and thereby to offer cancer patients optimal treatment or in other words, to uh, conduct very good, high quality clinical research through international collaboration and to implement the evidence, to implement the new knowledge into clinical practice. Next slide, please. So the question is, uh, why do we need international collaboration in palliative care research? Why couldn't we only have one institution and your research group? Well, I think we believe that we can improve the content, the thinking behind the projects, and uh, indeed the conducting of the projects. It will be better and higher quality and more patients can be included in the clinical research while we are collaborating. So what do we want to achieve? Well, we want to improve our understandings of the basic mechanisms, not only biological, but also psychological and social and spiritual. We want to plan and conduct, as I already elaborated on, the best clinical studies. By best, we, we mean that we have to write, we have to ask the right research questions and we need to conduct high quality studies and we need to interpret the data and it needs to be implemented into clinical practice as rapid as possible and together 
we want to do these research projects. Next slide, please. So how can PRC contribute to the evidence base? Well, we are focusing on some areas which are not covering everything in palliative care, just some, some fragments. It's pain and symptom management, it's nutrition and cachexia, it's health services research, it's about how we assess and how do we classify the patients in order to give them more personalized care and treatment. It's about psychosocial interventions, including end-of-life care. And we want also to collaborate with basic scientists, both from biomedicine and from psychosocial areas and from healthcare. And we want to ed educate and disseminate our results. Next slide, please. We are a lot of people, and there are many centers uh, included uh, in uh, the PRC network. And for me, it's uh, also very nice, and I'm very happy to, uh, that a new center uh, was signed up during the last days from uh, Institute of Culture and Society from uh, University of Navarra. So that's the latest center which signed up. And here you see the rest of the centers, and there will be presenters from very many of these centers during today and tomorrow. So I heartily welcome you, and I hope that you will have two fruitful days. So welcome and enjoy. Thank you. Welcome to two exciting days focusing on research on palliative care. We in the Norwegian Cancer Society are very happy to arrange this seminar. We hoped we would see each other live, but we're so glad that you joined in digitally. Our health services is traditionally centered on doctors and diagnosis. This means that the services has largely been built up and rigged around the doctors and the individual diagnosis and not sufficiently based on the patient's needs. The treatment has been disease-centered and rather than patient-centered. Today's patients expect to be active in the decisions about their own treatments and care. Therefore, a patient-centered perspective is a necessary part of today's cancer treatment. Perhaps this is especially important when the cancer can no longer be cured and the patient receives palliative care. To improve the lives of patients with incurable cancer, the question is, what is most important to you now? What symptoms do you experience? And what kind of thoughts do you have in your situation? What about your loved ones or, your, or the people that are around you? What do they need? When it comes to the latter, of course, the next of kin and the relatives should be given an opp opportunity to speak for themselves. Both when cancers are cured, but especially when they cannot be, cure, be cured, it is important to find a good balance between how to treat the cancer itself in parallel with the patients being cared for in a good way. Through studies, we know that by giving the right treatment, reducing side effects and looking for at the patient's quality of life, patients will live longer and, with the, and at the same time feel better. When it comes to incurable cancer and palliation, we have a good deal of research. And on this note, I would like to thank the researchers in the palliative environment in Norway. You have prioritized areas that we know are of great importance to live longer and not at least live as good a life as possible despite the fact that life has been given some sort of an expiration date. You have in particular taken care of research areas that deal with better pain relief, prevention and treatment of malnutrition, and palliative radiation therapy. Not least, you, have cons you are concerned with achieving a better integration of the palliative patient-centered competence into all parts of the cancer treatment process. I'm very happy for this international collaboration, cooperation, and all the research that is being done. 
There are so many important topics to be touched upon in this seminar. And I hope, therefore, you have two very fruitful days. The best of luck. Ingrid, Stein, thank you for setting the stage for these two days. I'm now honored to introduce the next speaker, Professor Irene Higginson. She is director of the Cicely Saunders Institute at King's College London, and the title of her talk is Integrated Clinical Care Education and Research, Including End-of-Life Care, Current and Future Trends. Thank you, Tonya. Uh, thank you, Stein. And, and thank you, PRS and, and everyone here for your um, uh, leadership and, um, uh, and collaboration in palliative care. I agree wholeheartedly with what Stein was saying uh, about the importance of collaboration. And I'm delighted to be joining you here from London. Uh, and I'm also quite delighted not to be going through a train uh, on a train and a plane and everything right now with all the problems. I'm going to speak for uh, just a few minutes and I'm going to attempt to screen share, um, which is always a little uh, delayed in coming up. So it'll come up very shortly. Um, here we go. It's just loading at the moment. Um, and hopefully you should be able to see this now. Um, so as Tonya said, I'm going to talk about the integrated clinical care education and research. I was asked to talk primarily about end-of-life care, and I understand the focus is cancer, so I'm not going to particularly talk about uh, cancer issues. I want to remind us why cancer is important. Um, the incidence, which is shown here on the left-hand side as you look at the screen, and the mortality, which is shown here on the right-hand side of the screen, um, is projected to increase across Europe between now and 2040. So cancer is not going away in terms of incidence or mortality. And so the role for palliative care in cancer will continue. Now, for me, the integration of clinical education and research is critical. I'm going to start with clinical and reflect a little bit on some of the issues in assessment, in symptom um, management and review, and then also look at the ways in which symptoms may predict and identify the individuals who most need palliative care. So there was a very elegant study published uh, recently with uh, members of the uh, PRC Collaborative as authors on it, looking at quality of life and symptom intensity over time in people receiving palliative care. It's, it's rare to get these kind of studies, so they're very welcome. 30 palliative care centres, 12 countries. Patients were followed um, prospectively until they died through the services and you can see here that quality of life which is shown um, in in the graph in in some of the symptom uh, in some of the areas was reducing that's overall quality of life and also uh, different aspects of quality of life including uh, emotional and physical functioning and you can see how se uh, pain fatigue appetite loss breathlessness insomnia and constipation increased a similar um, uh, prospective study from a group in Portugal using the integrated palliative care outcome scale also followed patients prospectively over time. Um, they found that actually um, uh, single items for depression and anxiety were quite good at predicting anxiety and depression compared to the much longer hospital anxiety scale and that um, continuing palliative care needs beyond symptoms such as psychosocial and family related needs did continue and so um, actually trying to screen for some problems would be helpful. But I take care because average trajectories, these trajectories that we're showing you look very smooth, hide individual um, fluctuations and this is what some work done by my colleague Christina Ramsenthaler on people with um, uh, multiple myeloma over time and what you can see is that although the average trajectory which are the thick black lines in each of the graphs looks quite smooth 
In fact, it hides be in, be up behind that a huge web of individual variation. Which suggests that early warnings or trigger warnings to try and detect these symptoms, particularly to help us in end of life care, could be valuable. And interestingly, we don't need a clever biomarker. We know now that earlier symptoms and anxiety predict declining quality of life and other problems. So uh, in this study, again by Christina Ramsenthaler, which was published um, earlier this year, the strongest predictors of poor outcome at the end of life were the general symptom levels uh, measured using the MyPOS, a myeloma specific uh, outcome measure, uh, the presence of anxiety, and slightly, the odds ratio is not very strong there, the presence of pain. And these were more predictive than demographic or clinical characteristics. And this um, finding is supported by an earlier systematic review that found that symptoms, pain, and performance status and mental health were better predictors of later quality of life than any of the traditional disease variables that you would see in myeloma. So there's some very important um, potential findings for us in searching through this. And um, uh, we use in the clinic and many other centers do the palliative care outcome scale which puts the patient's self-reported questions first, and it also has symptoms, psychosocial and care questions. There are staff, patient and care versions. It starts with the first uh, main problems, and it's very quick to complete. Um, so it takes normally only about five to 10 minutes, even for patients to complete it. And there are three day or seven day versions. Um, and there's um, a, a website with free resources for people in the spirit of international co collaboration. The validations of POS have involved a large UK and German cohort, as well as other studies in New Zealand, Turkey and Italy. It appears to have a three factor structure. Um, it's got a strong ability to distinguish between clinically relevant groups. It's got good validity when you compare it to various other potential measures that are also good measures uh, and good internal consistency and uh, appropriate reliability. Um, and it can detect change. And we have guidance on how to translate it and adapt it that people are free to, to use for their own measures or others. Now I want to move us on because our time is limited to a little bit on the issues of education. So it's a key role for palliative care and I think um, is a sign of a specialist palliative care service that it does offer education. Um, there are many different audiences. There is the primary and hospital care teams, particularly oncology, but there's also care homes, and I was very impressed at the system in Norway and the links that were set up by Stein's group um, providing support into care homes. Um, uh, it may need to also provide education for families and informal carers who are working on the, in the home, for patients themselves, for undergraduates and postgraduates, for our colleagues, and also I think it's important to remember that we need education for ourselves. And there was a very interesting few studies published looking at the barriers that discouraged oncologists from discussing palliative care from um, patients. And this uh, particular study from Belgium identified seven different categories, which were kind of related to the oncologist, related to the patient, to the family or those important to them, to the physician who referred the person to the oncologist, to the disease or treatment, particularly when there was uncertainty around that, institutional and organizational barriers, so not knowing what to do, where to go, and then also society and policy barriers. Um, and oncologists re responded to these different challenges quite differently. Some proactively tried to facilitate things, but others would leave the initiative um, to the patient. So although education can be part of improving better referrals and improving care outside of um, a specialist palliative care, it shouldn't be left to education alone and we need other strategies. And to emphasize that even more, there was a recent study led by my colleague Gao Wei, 
um, looking at primary care service use by end-of-life cancer patients, um, which looked across the whole of the United Kingdom, analyzed data on over 68,000 cancer patients who were in the last year of life. Now, interestingly, of these cancer patients, 75% had comorbidities. That tells us how our cancer populations are changing. And in the last year of life, a typical cancer patient had 43 consultations with their GP or family doctor, seven, 71 and a half prescriptions, that's an average obviously, with 21 different drugs. They also had referrals to other clinical specialties. So a key uh, uh, role is to try and look at improving the primary palliative care skills among family doctors and also to reflect on the potential for deep de um, prescribing and what interested me is how if you look at the last four and particularly the last three months of life the prescriptions and the consultations increased markedly so it's interesting that primary care is involved with patients in the last year of life doing these consultations but it's also important to reflect on how they are and it's also interesting to note that the, the sort of ready line um, is people who had um, been identified as having palliative care needs, whereas the purple line was those who didn't. So GPs were um, giving more, in a way, to the people who they identified had palliative care needs. And then finally, um, the importance of research. So I'll just spend a few minutes on this, and then we can have some questions if there's time. So research is important to understand and improve practice. And this shows you the challenges of off-medicine use, which is a particular issue around end-of-life care. This is data from the team um, in, um, uh, in America, um, but there's a similar survey in, in the UK. So while off-label um, uh, prescribing may be a po uh, appropriate at time, it also is often subject to poor understanding and documentation poor consent and lacks efficacy and, and may miss adverse events. And in view of that, I was delighted to read this study recently published in September um, uh, by uh, the team from Copenhagen, uh, looking at um, in a hospice, the, in prospective and retrospective cohorts, the drugs administered subcutaneously. 90% uh, of patients had those. There were 30 different drugs administered, um, and uh, about two-thirds of them were off-label. However, the good news is that there were few and minor adverse drug reactions, so this should give us comfort to understanding the ways in which we do things, and I think this sort of research is very important for us for the future. And if you think it's all easy or the policy makers think it all easy. There is the uh, challenges that were faced around the Liverpool Care Pathway, the report that was produced here, which said that um, the evidence review showed no strong evidence for the benefits or adverse e events, uh, effects or risks of the pathway. And I think that we need research to understand even sometimes simple interventions and to ensure that the essential ingredients are present when something is implemented. And I think this work also highlights the importance of patient and public involvement and engagement in research. So people are actually saying, actually, it is important to research this topic. We shouldn't just roll things out without an understanding of the evidence base. And I'll end with a few reflections on a symptom that I think is, is very important and often missed in cancer, which is breathlessness. Think that in most parts of the world, apart from Australia, there is no drug that is that is licensed for the management of refractory or chronic breathlessness. And in cancer, people often become invisible, and yet we neglect really simple things like walking aids, and people go into a spiral of disability and inactivity. I know you've got presentations tomorrow on cachexia. We were able to put together an evidence-based series of interventions uh, to show that early integrated palliative care improved things and also improved survival, which was a surprising finding for us. And we moved that on now to being able to provide patients and families with home toolkits that they have before they get very severe with breathlessness so they're practiced in using them. 
And at the moment, we're trialing, uh, we're developing and trialing a self-guided internet-based intervention, moving to digital. Um, we've conducted a meta-analysis that shows the benefits of this type of service, and we also have available, and again, it's free if anyone would like to do it, if you just Google ebreathe.org, then there's some free online learning that we have available on the management of breathlessness. So I'll end with some take-home thoughts. So cancer is increasing and the end of life care will be critical. But bear in mind that the populations will often be multimorbid and older. Because of this and because we need to um, really improve the end of life care for probably many more patients than we can directly care for, routine assessment is going to be critical and it is possible in practice. And practice needs this research and some of the data from these routine assessments can go to help towards the research and audit data. An assessment may be important to also trigger palliative care referrals, particularly from oncology. And I'd like us to move to a situation where oncologists don't wait until things are very difficult. And I know you've got further talks on integration, so I think it feeds into that. And I think that will help with people at the end of life. I think education has an important role with multiple audiences and e-learning. And that research is needed to try and understand complex interventions or even simple interventions in a complex context. The need for clinical integration with research and with education. And also the need to test and to discover new treatments to improve symptom management and holistic care. So thank you very much for the for your attention and I hope that we can get into some discussion. Thank you Irene for a great talk. We have a couple of minutes for some questions. I don't think there are any in the chat yet but if you have questions you can write them in the chat mm -hmm. and we will communicate them to Irene. But I I'm pretty sure Stan has a few up his sleeve. Irene, um, I have a, a combination of a reflection and a, uh, and, and a question. So you are describing complex intervention, complex care pathways, but on the other hand, you're also telling us that you can, in a simple way, classify the patient by looking at physical symptoms, emotional distress, and uh, communication in practice. So I, so I wonder how, how can we use this way of thinking or prognostication of classifying the patient in a busy oncology clinic where the main focus these days are wide genome classification, biomarkers, etc., etc immunotherapy because many of these patients receiving immunotherapy they have short life expectancy so so how, how how do we make the blend and how can we do research in order to to improve that blend um, th thank you Stein I think that's a that's a wonderful question so we looked at this um, m most in the area of myeloma where we were uh, developing this. And I th I th in a way, myeloma is a good example for this because they have all these intensive treatments and yet you have a very elderly population. And you have hematologists who, who are used to, um, uh, in a way, dealing with a lot of interventions where they, they can turn patients around very rapidly. So you have a lot of uncertainty in myeloma and quite a lot of steep trajectories. And what we found very interestingly is that the patients themselves were very up for doing these sorts of assessments. They thought that they would be very helpful. And I agree with you that any assessment is a simplification. I think, though, that an assessment is a key first step in moving to something more complicated. And what's really interesting, and we've seen this in renal disease, not in cancer, is that actually when the symptoms go off, uh, using uh, which you can detect in an assessment tool, then actually that's often a, a, a sign that the disease itself has got worse. So actually these m sim simple symptom markers are actually a, an excellent 
marker of somebody showing some deterioration, which should be a trigger for let's think that actually this person has a broader range of needs. And you can do some of these things preventatively in advance, as you can with cancer patients, selecting those who are more likely to deteriorate. But actually, you can also do it um, uh, in a way, in a complementary way, by trying to assess the symptoms. And I think it helps a busy clinic, because actually these sorts of questionnaires, like the MyPOS in myeloma or the IPOS, or other ones that your groups used, or the ESAS, are actually quick to use in the clinic. And people do them because they feel relevant. So the key is that somebody is looking at them. And with new systems with electronic records, actually, one can take these sorts of data and actually use them as, as triggers. And, and, and my joke, in a way, is this, is that I presented some of the data on, on myeloma and uh, also our renal work to, to a group of senior clinicians and uh, basic scientists. And they said, oh, gosh, so all we've got is what the patient's telling us about their symptoms. So we need work. We need research on a new marker. And in a way, I agree, but we also have something now which, is, uh, which can be used and actually has got quite good um, uh, sensitivity, specificity, and, and importantly, predictive power. So that, that's my, my solution. And some of it is about changing attitudes. Some of it is about using the data and making sure people can access things. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Um, we have some work to do to, I believe, to see how we can bring it uh, into clinical practice. And as you said, uh, these uh, patient reported outcomes uh, are actually uh, uh, rather stable uh, with regard to predict uh, what's going to happen. And w we should use it. It's cheap and simple and it's there. So, Tonya, uh, do you want to take over? Yes. Thank you again, Arin. I see on the page here that we have some difficulties with the chat, but they are trying to solve it. And meanwhile, we will go on in the program. Next up is Jet Vanesh uh, from the Department of Medical Oncology, Erasmus Cancer Institute, Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Jet submitted an excellent abstract and will present the results of an RCT on treatment of death rattle. Jet was supposed to be answering your questions in the chat after her presentation, but please keep your questions close and we use the chat when it's up and running again. Hello, my name is Jet van Es, and first I would like to thank the organization for giving me the opportunity to present my results of a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial in a frail population in hospices in the Netherlands. Death rattle is a sign that death is very close, hours away. The unpleasant noise is caused by accumulated fluids in the throat which cannot be, which cannot be coughed or swallowed away. In a recent study, 61% of the dying patients developed death rattle. More than 60% of these patients um, of a moderate to severe level. Relatives experienced death rattle as very stressful and expressed a great need for better care in case of this symptom. We found the same in our own research. Information and communication are not enough for relieving experiences of the relatives. So should we treat this symptom? Patients seem not to be bothered by it. The burden is on the relatives. So it's proper to ask the question if you should treat this symptom and the patient when he doesn't have any complaints. Treatment can also cause adverse events, which can hinder the last moments of life. But we only assume that patients do not experience this uh, symptom, and that's what we tell the relatives. And previous research tells us that death rattle could interfere with mourning because of this stressful event. So we treat the patients with anticholinergic drugs like scopolamine butyl bromide. This medication diminishes the mucus production. Efficacy of these drugs were studied and we found two RCTs in the literature. Both were performed when death rattle already existed, uh, and both found no differences uh, in the effect on death rattle or on adverse events. A larger observational study compared three regularly used medications for death rattle and found no differences in efficacy nor in adverse events, but it didn't incorporate a placebo arm. 
And when we look at how the medication works, it prevents mucus and it's not mucus removal, it's understandable that these findings were not significant. So what if we gave these drugs prophylactically? One randomized controlled trial from 2018 showed results that, there were, that were in favor of the use of scopolamine butyl to prevent this symptom. But the most important comment on this study is that this research is not double-blind placebo-controlled. As you treat patients who possibly won't develop death rattle, and as adverse events of this medication as a dry mouth, urinary retention and delirium can occur, it's the goal to give this medication to patients dying phase. And an RCT is the only way to say if medication is effective and if it's safe to do so. And the co-production of Erasmus Medical Center and four hospices designed, conducted and finished an RCT, namely scopolamine butyl bromide given prophylactically for death rattle, the silence study. The procedures were as followed. After admission, eligibility was checked and the patient was informed about the study, and after 84 hours reflection, the patient could sign an informed consent when he wishes to participate. Inclusion criteria were a life expectancy longer than three days, aware that admission was up to death, and a good understanding of all the information. When the dying phase was recognized, inclusion criteria were evaluated again, and when the patient used systemic anticholinergic drugs or octreotide, had signs of an active respiratory infection or had death rate of grade 1 or higher at the start, this patient was excluded. Study medication was randomized and given every six hours from the moment we recognized the dying phase. The recognition of the dying phase was also the start for the care program of the dying. The care program of the dying was used for recording adverse events and death rate of scores. Our primary endpoint was the percentage of patients who developed death rattle defined as the occurrence of death rattle with a severity of grade 2 or higher according to the scale of Beck at two consecutive measurements with an interval of four hours. Secondary endpoints are named here on the slide. An important secondary endpoint included the time from the recognition of the dying phase until the occurrence of death rattle and the occurrence of the adverse, adverse events of anticholinergics as restlessness, urinary retention and a dry mouth. For the results, from April 2017 until the end of December of 2019, the hospices admitted 1,079 patients, of which 635 met the inclusion criteria. 533 patients were asked to participate, and from them, 229 signed the informed consent. Eventually, 107 patients could be allocated. Baseline characteristics were well balanced across the groups. Men and women were equally divided and the median age of the patients was 70 years in the scopolamine butyl bromide group, where it was 75 years in the placebo group. Among all patients, 80% had cancer and COPD and coronary heart diseases were the most frequent comorbidities. The SILENT study met, met its primary aim. A significantly higher percentage of patients developed death rattle in the placebo group compared to the scopolamine butyl group, 27% versus 13%, which was statistical significant. Figure A on the slide shows the risk of death rattle. This was significantly lower in the scopolamine butyl bromide group. The sensitivity analysis, which is shown in diagram B, confirmed the primary analysis. Here I show the time to adverse events in this figure. There are no significant differences in the occurrence of adverse events between the treatment groups. For my discussion, I can tell you that prophylactically given scopolamine butyl bromide is effective for reducing death rattle in the dying phase, and that prophylactically given scopolamine butyl bromide does not harm the patients. Prophylactically given scopolamine butyl bromide addresses the burden of the symptom for the relatives without any harm to the patients. One of the strengths of this study is that this is the first RCT of this magnitude at end of life performed in hospices and it shows that large-scale RCTs are feasible in the dying phase.
This study has also some limitations, and one limitation could be that the recognition of the dying phase was based on criteria in the Dutch guidelines and on the experience of the healthcare professionals. We did not use a tool because there is none. This may have resulted in various interpretations of recognizing the dying phase. To conclude, prophylactically given scopolaminobutyl bromide, once the dying phase is recognized, reduces the risk of death rattle and does not give any adverse events. And randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials in the dying phase in hospice settings are feasible, so we can do more research to provide evidence-based treatment at the end of life. And on behalf of all contributors to this study, I thank you for your attention. Many thanks to, to Jet Van Esch for this very interesting presentation. The chat is now working again as well. So, But we'll now take a 10 minutes break. And when we're back, Chairs Per Sjögren and Stein Kosa will guide us through the next session on integrated oncology and palliative care. See you soon. Okay, welcome back to the next session. It's a pleasure for me, Pierre Schögrein, I'm from Copenhagen, to introduce my co-chair, as you all know, Stein Kasa. And uh, we are going to be engaged in a very hot topic, integrated oncology and, and palliative care. And as you know, numerous RCTs has been uh, developed the recent years within this area. But we are very interested to know more about the content of this integration process. And therefore, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Chris Vissels uh, from the Radboud University Nijmegen Medical Center. And his topic is Organization and Education of Palliative Care in an Integrated Model at the Radboud University Nijmegen Medical Center in the Netherlands. Please, Chris. So thank you, Per, and thank you, Stein, for this wonderful organization and the wonderful meeting together. I just show you my disclosures. Uh, but all of you are missing now the wonderful city of Nijmegen. And I'm sure that a lot of people don't know Nijmegen in the east of the country. You know all Amsterdam, Rotterdam, but it's the low country area, Nijmegen, to the German frontier, a place with a wonderful ends of the Roman Empire location, so wonderful excavations and cities to, to visit. Uh, you see here the bridge, and that bridge is not the famous bridge of Arnhem, but the last year we had a lot, a lot of visitors before that the virus was prohibiting that you all coming to our wonderful area. So I hope next time I can welcome you at the Nijmegen Medical Center, where we are very happy to welcome you. Um, our story in Nijmegen started in the connection, and verbind is a Dutch word for connection, with a GP, Karel Veldhoven. And you see uh, here Karel Veldhoven together with Evelyn Kuyp, who is one of the organizers of this meeting with me. Yeah, And we were successful with a wonderful team. You see here the vice president of the EAPC, Jeroen Hasselaar. He wrote a book on integrated palliative care. You see my first chaplain in palliative care of the Netherlands. You see Carlo Leguet, a past vice president, and Eva, uh, Yvonne Engels, who is a professor in meaning sense of meaning. And we had a lot of people making things possible, but most important, this was really in 1983, a multidisciplinary team of medical doctors of internal medicine, anesthesiology, internal medicine, medical oncology, and of uh, medical ethics. And they wanted to integrate oncology and palliative care for the future. So really important to look at. And I was really astonished to see a wonderful statement of Professor Kotman from Harvard University in 1917. And that message is still connected to this meeting because I heard that clinical parameters should be monitored all over and that he was called eccentric to willing monitoring clinical outcome parameters of patients to have the best possible outcome and if not to compare your results. So I'm so proud that Steinkaiser also want to build that structure of integrated oncology and palliative care so that we can show what we are doing to the world. And once again, thanks for all your efforts and inspiration. 
So we were the first ESMO-related designated integrated oncology and palliative care department with a lot of people participating in our clinical case discussions. And again, you see here Karel Velto as a GP, as a real chair of our society and of our local organization to connect the transmural care, the oncologist, with the home care situation. So going from that, you all know the Netherlands because we had a huge discussion about palliative sedation. We had a huge discussion about euthanasia. But more important, our message should be about what is the normal pathway of human beings. And this picture is now used by the GPs of the Netherlands to show that there is a normal pathway for all our patients at the end of life. And it's a little bit about the Swiss life feeling because we all have a feeling that we want to be an autonomous and that we have to make our own choi choices. But that's not always possible to have these kinds of end targets. And it was wonderfully stated already by Diana Meyer in 2005, and that was my inspiration for the Netherlands to start with a special program about quality of life. Medical progress retunes a lot of diseases from terminal to chronic diseases. We all know that. But improving the quality of life of this prolongation of life seems to be much more difficult. This is still true for nowadays. And a wonderful paper from 2013 from uh, the New England Journal of Medicine from Timothy Quill stated that we need to teach general palliative care all over the place to all medical doctors and nurses, but it should be additionalized by a specialist palliative care program so that if people want to have more knowledge, they can come and create a sustainable model for the future. And why is that so important? It's not important only for oncology, as you can see here, here from another New England Medical Journal paper where there was a beautiful overview of the symptoms, yeah, but it's also true for congestive heart failure, COPD, for kidney disease, for dementia, and for AIDS. So we started in 2005, six with a group of very enthusiastic people working in palliative care in the hospice curia. And you can see here also, um, Kevin van der Rijt, who is joining this meeting, and a lot of other people. And I was the first professor, but soon after my professorship, a lot of other professors came in, and together, a strong group of people, we were forcing the Ministry of Health to look, make a choice for palliative care. And of course, we were very happy that the Queen of the Netherlands at that time, that she was in 2014 supporting us and the mission of palliative care, by all different steps. And that is really important for a country if you want to have a national program for palliative care that is integrated in the normal care and the oncological care, please ask your leaders of your country and, and, and ask them to go for your mission. And that was the case for the Netherlands. So we are very proud of that situation. We made a special national program and that national program has three important pillars. It's a pillar on research, on education, but for most, and that's now nowadays busy, for implementation. And it was not only about symptoms, but it was about the culture and the knowledge of the society. What is palliative care? What is end-of-life care? It was about organization and continuity of care. It's questions, innovative care interventions, and finally patients and proxies participation that should be all over, but we should also teach and help our patients to communicate with us. All these programs resulted in wonderful research protocols, as you have seen by the presentation of Yet van S, which is part of it. So we integrated over the years, 2005 National Guidelines for Oncology. The, 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 the surprise question in 2010, we go, went over to is everything necessary what is uh, what should be done yeah and finally yeah the treatment wishes of patients 2016 but most important going over was also the introduction of spiritual care with wonderful guidelines over the last years integrating that view of spiritual care and normal curative care uh, at the at the edge of uh, oncological care and the next step was in 2015, under the leadership of Palliactive and the Integrated Cancer Center of the Netherlands, 
where that Karin van Breit is the chairman of, was a quality framework for palliative care of the Netherlands for all scientific societies of medical professionals and institutions. And this was really a brand mark moment because now we can compare each organization, each institution, long-term care facilities, hospices to a quality standard and going to the integrated care of pathways of patients. And that was a brand mark moment. We are now having that structure and that process and we go to a lot of consortia all over the country. Seven consortia strongly connected to the academic network centers and we have a structure now for palliative care research by a Paulson Research Foundation, by educational work, uh, networks and by care consultations for difficult cases. And all these networks are connecting with a high local uh, entity and possibilities to look for the future. So it's a guiding operational structure for the Netherlands and we are available and waiting for international multidisciplinary studies that can be run by Palzon, really important for the future. This structure is connected to a, cor a corn group of people and in this corn, in this uh, group, all societies which are important for the Ministry of Health are connected and go into the consortia and go to the academic networks that are strongly interrelated, connected to this program. This resulted in a huge dramatic improvement of palliative care teams in the hospitals. Just one example of the research of Ariane Brinkman from Rotterdam uh, together with uh, Karen van der Heijden and Agnes van der Heijden and they showed that we have now in almost all hospitals all over the world, all over the country, a good palliative care team. This national program, which is called Palliancy, yeah, can, you can read up on the website of our Ministry of Health and Welfare. That resulted in this wonderful program. And there is one major topic I want to name to you, that is our educational framework that is now for all professionals available and made by these possibilities of Palianci. So having not only the structure, good societies and a structure for processes, but that we hope will improve in a better outcome of our medical uh, activities in palliative care connected to oncology, to cardiology, to lung diseases. Yeah. And then finally, we have also a research foundation which is centralized in the country, which is guided by Professor Brechia Okonaweka Philipsen, by Yvonne Engels and Agnes van der Heide. And they are working very hard to connect and to see what are the black holes in research for the future. And we hope that we can join with this research foundation the mission of the Palliative Care Research Network. Very important. But only the Ministry of Health should be the whole time over pushed forward. So Karen van der Rijt, Professor Anne Reiners, Professor Saskia Teunis and myself, we are making now a, a pushing working party from all professionals by the consortia, by the academic centers of the Netherlands and by a special society, which is an umbrella society for palliative care, making better implemented in the country. The whole story of Corona gave us a lot of possibilities last month because we were very visible by the Advanced Care Plan program and by a wonderful website where all professionals, not only palliative care, but all professionals can get a lot of information. And just as an example, you can read it up on the internet. So here you see again Evelyn Kerb with the patients in that special supportive and palliative care program for us then in Radboud Nijmegen and I hope that you will wel I can welcome all of you next year. My take home message for all of you is that an integrated care program should connect to the local, to the regional, to the national and to the international mission of palliative care. That is really of utmost importance. It should involve all healthcare professionals in the transmural model between patient home and the specialized services to support at all places. And for all the countries who do not yet have a national program, please, you need a national program to be connected to the Ministry of Health and to make the connection with all the professionals. 
Once again, I want to really congratulate the 10th year anniversary of the organization of the European Palliative Research Center. Um, and I hope to welcome you with all my collaborators next year again in Nijmegen. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Chris, for this uh, wonderful talk uh, outlining the integration of palliative care with many different di disciplines in the Netherlands. I think it's, it's really inspiring, uh, not at least for us in Denmark, to follow your example. I think there's time for a question, Stein. Yeah, well, <clears throat> or maybe we should move on and take Camilla first and then Okay. Uh, we will get questions uh, from the web uh, as well as uh, <clears throat> we can have a debate with uh, Chris and Camilla afterwards. So, so I think I'll introduce Camilla. Camilla Zimmerman uh, from uh, Toronto. Uh, she is uh, a leading person in uh, palliative uh, care, in palliative care clinic and palliative care research. Uh, in Canada and in Toronto. She's at the Princess Margaret uh, Hospital. Um, she has been conducting important and extensive research projects, specifically in how can we better uh, integrate uh, palliative care into mainstream medicine and mainstream oncology. So it's, it's a great, great honor for me, and uh, I'm very happy that uh, Camilla is uh, is, is here, so I'm looking forward to hear your talk. Hello, my name is Camilla Zimmerman, and I'm going to talk to you about symptom management in an integrated model of oncology and palliative care um, at uh, the Princess Margaret Cancer Center, which is where I work, um, and mainly about my um, research program in this area. So I have no disclosures, and my objectives are to review early palliative care trials, including at Princess Margaret, and present an ongoing trial of symptom screening with targeted palliative care at our center. So ASCO and many other agencies, including ESMO and others, now say that inpatients and outpatients with advanced cancer should receive dedicated palliative care services early in the disease course concurrent with active treatment. And this statement is based on many different um, early palliative care trials now, um, mostly in the US and also in, in uh, Europe and um, in Canada. Um, and these have shown, uh, most of them have shown that palliative care when started early um, for all patients with advanced solid tumor cancers improves quality of life. And there's some, some trials in hematologic diseases that show this now as well. And um, early, at least um, for, for the patients with solid tumors in outpatient settings, which is what I'm going to talk about, mainly means within eight, weeks, eight, eight to 12 weeks of diagnosis or with a clinical prognosis of about six to 24 months. And our trial at Princess Margaret Cancer Center also showed uh, the same thing, that early palliative care when instituted for patients um, with a prognosis of six to 24 months showed better quality of life, a satisfaction with care, and symptom control than for control patients who received standard oncology care. Um, we're now working on a new phase three uh, trial, and I'm going to present to you the rationale for this new trial. Um, and it does involve symptoms, I'm getting to that. Um, so the interventions for most trials so far have tested routine early specialized palliative care without any um, screening uh, symptom for symptoms or anything else. And the challenges with this model are that we have, as we all know, widespread shortages of palliative care um, um, resources, especially specialized palliative care services. Our referral practices tend to be inconsistent um, by oncologists and other uh, specialists who refer. 
the uh, palliative care intervention is not necessarily targeted to those in greatest need. So the, the uh, trials, um, and also in clinical practice, who refers uh, depends on mainly the individual, um, rather than it being systematized in any way. Um, and in the trials, it was just everybody who received it. And also, early palliative care for everybody may be costly and unnecessary. So this is our current model of, of uh, integrated oncology palliative care at Princess Margaret. Uh, patients receive a referral to our palliative care outpatient clinic, um, hopefully early, um, by their oncologist. We see them in consultation. Um, we see them then uh, over a period of time collaboratively with their oncologist, with their family physician, and with community services. And then for end of life care, they go either um, they receive this care in their home or in our acute palliative care unit or in a hospice or a community palliative care unit. Of course, um, this whole thing starts with a referral by an oncologist and um, this is what we're sort of trying to systematize a bit more. So and we've also shown, and this is from qualitative research conducted with 40 patients and caregivers after our early palliative care trial, um, that, that patients and caregivers identify these four different domains um, that they think um, uh, were, were um, influential in improving their care. And one is prompt personalized symptom management. And we do perform routine symptom screening already at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. And this is, of course, getting more and more prominent throughout the oncology world. Um, we use the ESAS-R, the Revised Edmonton Symptom Assessment um, System. And what used to happen before COVID is that uh, patients would come into the hospital and then in the oncology clinic, there would be tablets they would, um, or computers in the waiting areas of the oncology clinics and uh, the patients would complete their symptoms on these tablets or computers. Now, of course, with COVID, um, this is no longer happening. And what we've been doing at the Cancer Center as of um, a few weeks ago is that patients are, uh, are sent an email 48 hours before their oncology appointment, and they actually fill out their symptoms either on their, uh, their phone or on a computer at home 48 hours before they come in or within 48 hours of coming in. And if they forget, then, uh, then the... Uh, um, the patient flow coordinator at the uh, clinic reminds them. So we're utilizing this routine screening at oncology visits for our early palliative care, uh, targeted early palliative care uh, trial. So this is the intervention arm of the trial. This, this whole thing on the slide is the, actually the intervention. Uh, patients receive screening at every oncology visit that I've described. If they don't meet symptom criteria, they just continue screening. If they meet the symptom criteria in orange, in the orange box on the right there, and those criteria are um, greater than four or equal to uh, four out of 10 for pain, shortness of breath, nausea, depression, and anxiety, or greater than or equal to seven out of 10 for fatigue, drowsiness, appetite, and well-being. And if they meet that threshold, then an automatic email is sent to a palliative care triage nurse who calls them, assesses their symptoms with them on the phone, and offers a palliative care referral. They can either accept or decline that referral or defer um, the referral. And if they defer, then the, they just continue screening again, but the nurse communicates with the oncology team to let them know to follow up about the symptoms. And if they accept, the patient is seen with, uh, within one to two weeks in the palliative care clinic. So we've done um, uh, several things along the way, several steps <laughs> already uh, of this research. Uh, the first was a phase two trial, which we've submitted for, for publication. It's a non-randomized uh, controlled, sorry, non-randomized, not controlled uh, trial of, of STEP. And I'll show you a bit about that in the next few slides. Uh, the next is a uh, three-arm uh, pilot uh, phase two trial of, of STEP, early palliative care for everybody, like all the trials have done so far, and standard care. 
Um, that uh, second randomized three-arm trial um, basically showed that three arms were not acceptable for patients. Um, everybody when offered either step or routine early palliative care uh, wanted the step arm. So uh, we had great difficulty actually randomizing um, because when offered either palliative care right away or offered the chance to get randomized to either palliative care right away or palliative care a bit later when your symptoms show that you need palliative care, uh, they no longer were interested in the trial because they wished to defer until their symptoms um, would mandate care. So good for STEP, not so good for the three-arm trial. Um, and then a, a phase three trial, which we've actually started now at two centers, and we got funding for that, uh, Kingston General Hospital um, and Princess Margaret Cancer Center uh, for STEP versus routine care. So just to go through, um, again, it's a single arm trial. Uh, it's a feasibility study. So the, the point was to see if a larger trial was feasible. Um, participation, the participants were similar to our, our first trial published in the Lancet, um, except that they had a somewhat perhaps better prognosis. We had no upper limit of two years, so it was just greater than or equal to six months. Recruited from the same clinics. And they completed uh, baseline uh, measures and then measures at two, four, and six months instead, instead of uh, stopping at four months, um, again, because the patients are probably a little bit more well uh, because of the lack of the cutoff at the top there in terms of their prognosis. And the primary outcome uh, we suggested was at, uh, at six months. So this part of the trial was to see whether where our outcome should be. Um, the outcome measures were quality of life, symptom control, depression, and satisfaction with care. And to make a long story um, short, because I'm running short on time, uh, the study was indeed feasible. We enrolled 110 patients in a year, 116 overall. Um, we aimed to enroll 100 patients um, and 77 percent completed screening for at least 70 percent of visits. Uh, one thing I should note here is that um, of those who received a triggered call, 56 percent received palliative care. And we were hoping actually that um, more would actually receive palliative care. A few received palliative care after the trial was over, um, after the six months time point. Um, but of course, they wouldn't have uh, completed the, the primary outcome measure then. Um, but so more than more than um, we thought actually deferred the visit. One thing we did do though is looked at the end at six months whether outcomes differed for those who accepted early palliative care or deferred early palliative care. So everybody got the intervention in this phase two trial, but there were of course acceptors and deferrers. And what we found is those who accepted palliative care at the end at six months had actually better symptom control and less deterioration in mood um, than those who deferred. And this is uh, controlling for the severity of symptoms. So to conclude, there is uh, good evidence from randomized controls trials for the benefit of early palliative care without symptom screening. We've seen that in many different trials. Um, we're conducting an ongoing phase three trial of uh, symptom screening with targeted early palliative care that may provide evidence that providing palliative care based on symptoms also improves quality of life and may be more um, resource um, efficient uh, and cost effective. And interestingly, acceptance of palliative care is still an issue, even, even within this trial, and collaboration with oncology is essential. So thank you very much to, your, uh, to you for your attention. And I also want to thank my collaborators and uh, co-investigators. Um, both at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center and also at the King's Kingston General Hospital where we're doing our ongoing phase three trial. And thank you to my funders, the Canadian Cancer Society and the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. And um, I hope you'll have many questions for me. Thanks very much. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Camille, for this interesting talk. I think we now have some questions uh, from the audience in the box. Um, I have I had one here, and it's it's a general question to Camilla. Um, should early palliative service include management of medical issues such as adverse effects of cancer-directed therapy? That's the first question. Do you think that a change in nomenclature is, is warranted? Do you think that a move beyond supportive and palliative care is required since the term supportive does not necessarily include medical management? Um, so thank, first of all, I want to, to uh, thank Stein and, and um, uh, thank you for allowing me to be here all the way from Toronto. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, my presentation was was re-recorded, pre-recorded, so I wasn't able to to thank Stein at the beginning. Um, so that, so that's really I, I would say two questions. One is whether a change in nomenclature is required, and um, and the other is whether um, early palliative care should also include adverse effects. Um, that's a very very important. Uh, both are very important questions. In, in terms of adverse effects. Um, the uh, the oncologists generally are the ones who are are handling the adverse um, effects of the chemotherapy um, and immunotherapy agents, um, but we work in close collaboration with them. So I think the most important part of any early palliative care is the integration part, and the uh, intervention. Although it's a specialized palliative care intervention. Um, palliative care should not only be provided by the palliative care team, but you know, broadly stated, uh, palliative care does also include adverse effects, but those need to be handled in collaboration with the oncology. So we do have very close communication with the oncologists, um, both in person and, and also um, by email. And also now that we're on um, Teams and Zoom and all these um, different kinds of, of media, we're able to bring the patient, the oncologist, and the, the palliative care physician uh, together all in, in one um, video conference meeting and have discussions. So I think um, technology has assisted us as well in handling um, these issues uh, uh, collaboratively. Uh, the, the, the trend in terminology is, I think, a different question, whether we still call our palliative care clinic a palliative care clinic, um, even though um, patients may um, have questions about what palliative care is. Uh, we see this as part of the education that goes on about palliative care. So we have not changed the name of our, our clinic to supportive care like um, other centers, for instance, MD Anderson has done that. I think it's up to every individual center what they choose to do. Um, but uh, we see that as part of, part of the intervention and part of the uh, This is fine. Uh, Chris, could I... I mean, you showed us an extensive program, which uh, I have followed for the last uh, one and a half decade in Holland, and it's very impressive. So, so I actually have two questions to you. One um, is related to the latest one that Camilla uh, replied to. What about uh, naming uh, of uh, what we are doing? Should we call palliative care, palliative and supportive care or something else. Is that something you are struck with in, in Holland? Yeah. And my it's, it's, my yes. second question is uh, related to why have you been so successful in the last one to two decades to really implement a nationwide program in Holland? Yeah. So the, to the first question, I think that uh, for all of us are following for the next, uh, for the past 10 years, the whole discussion of uh, uh, Professor Bruera, who changed his name in 2007 to supportive care, and then finally palliative care. It was wonderful how successful were the, the, the referrals to his center by only changing a name. So in the last five to ten years, under the leadership of Karen van Rijt, we had also that discussion and we finally, for the moment, concluded that we will hold the name palliative because the general public should be aware of their normal pathway and that includes a palliative trajectory. Mm. However, 
what we see, and that was wonderfully prepared by all the publications of Camilla, uh, what we observe, if you take the side effects of immunotherapy, and there is a wonderful uh, recommendation uh, statement document from Professor Van Poppel from Leuven uh, in Belgium, and if you compare the side effects of these treatments, they fully are in agreement or are comparable to palliative care side effects. So it's very hard not knowing what the patient had as a previous treatment to know what symptom is coming forward from an immunotherapeutic activity or from a normal palliative care pathway. So more integration for the future is really a huge important point of discussion. And we should that do on a scientific basis um, because um, I think that palliative care was rather straightforward till, till 2007, 2008, but by coming in the strategies of using the power of the human body and the human mind by immunotherapy, I think this world is dramatically changing and we should face that in our research. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Pierre, do we have any more questions? Uh, we no, have... I think we have to move on. We have an, another outstanding abstract presentation, and uh, this is uh, by Kamin Malfitano, and it is uh, the title is Distress in Family Carriers of Individuals with Newly Diagnosed Acute Leukemia. Please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carmine Malfitano. I'm a social worker in the Department of Supportive Care at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto, Canada. I'm here to talk today about the post-diagnosis distress of family caregivers of individuals with acute leukemia. I would like to thank my thesis supervisors. This is part of my PhD work, the research team, but of course, all the caregivers who share their experience during such a difficult moment in their life with the sole purpose of uh, contributing to research and give back to their community. Uh, the DSM-5 describes traumatic events as the exposure to actual or threatened death. And this maps in uh, advanced cancer to the diagnosis, the progression or the recurrence of the illness or the experience of distressing physical symptoms. The traumatic experience that follows a traumatic event is very well studied in other population, for example, following major physical trauma, but there's very little attention in cancer. And this is due to many reasons and partially to the difficulty of recruiting patients and especially caregivers after the diagnosis of cancer where there's uh, intense distress, there's preoccupations with appointment and procedures. Um, so research, participation in research is, re is really at the bottom of the priority list. We had an opportunity to study this period of time in acute leukemia. And this is because patients diagnosed with acute leukemia are hospitalized soon after diagnosis for the initiation of intensive uh, chemotherapy. We conduct a qualitative interviews with this patient where they describe their, uh, the trauma of diagnosis and the feeling of being abducted uh, by the illness. And we conducted a longitudinal quantitative uh, study uh, with over 360 patients. And what we found is that a over a third of these patients reported traumatic stress symptoms that met criteria for full uh, acute stress disorder. And the rates were higher than in this population than what is reported in following major physical trauma. Now there's robust evidence that family caregivers of patients with cancer are equally or more affected by the, than, uh, than patients. And in solid tumors at other time points in the illness trajectory, we found that caregivers' levels of distress are equal or even higher than that of the patient. And despite this, there's a virtually no research uh, in, uh, about the experience of family caregivers following the diagnosis of cancer. And of course, there's, no evidence, uh, there's very little evidence-based interventions to support them during this difficult time. So the current study is one of the few studies that are taking steps in this direction with the intention of building an understanding of the experience of uh, family caregivers of patients uh, following diagnosis of cancer, in this case uh, of patients with acute leukemia, uh, with the goal of eventually building an understanding, a, a base for evidence-based interventions. I've designed, the design um, follows a grander theory approach, and I've chosen to have no purposeful sampling for this research. Uh, 
I've approached every single in the, uh, patient that was admitted to our inpatient unit, asked them to identify their primary family caregiver, and interviewed all the caregivers that said yes. The uh, data comprises, comprised of audio recorded same structure interviews, uh, field notes, and I kept a reflection journal. I recruited nine caregivers, only two refused, and I didn't stop because of I reached saturation of things, but simply because of the pandemic. I had to stop recruitment in February of last year, and I will uh, start recruitment again as soon as the pandemic ends. Um, I did not expect any difference or any influence of the of time of uh, the of recruitment, uh, because I recruited caregivers about within two to three weeks. Uh, after admission to the hospital. But I was, proved, I was proven to be wrong as I started data analysis. Caregivers were, uh, were reporting a different level of distress in the moment, but also in recollecting the previous two to three weeks, they really talked about a, a large fluctuation of distress. Uh, so what I was able to do is to map the recruitment of these caregivers by anchoring the recruitment date to the admission to the hospital and really trace a trajectory of distress uh, that they go through. What you see at the bottom are the stages that patients have to go through when they are, uh, they're going through a diagnosis and treatment of acute, acute leukemia. There's an initial state, stage where they experience symptoms, they go through testing, uh, and finally they arrive at a diagnosis. They are admitted to the hospital, they receive injection for a induction chemotherapy, they experience symptoms and side effect from the treatment, they move through recovery from the symptoms, and then they are discharged. So I started to trace the level of distress and I really identified three stages. In a first stage that we call anticipatory uh, phase, caregivers talk about their difficulty with uncertainty. They still don't know what the diagnosis is. This is before the diagnosis. They talk about their difficulty with lack of control. And of course, they fear for a bad outcome. Uh, you can see an increase in distress that peaks at the moment of diagnosis. At this moment, caregivers talk about feeling shock, shattered, feeling like in a bad dream. Uh, the one of the most interesting findings of my research uh, was what happened in the moment after the diagnosis. Now, uh, the moment of diagnosis, caregivers really talk about fear of losing their loved one. Uh, I was afraid that there was nothing we could do. I was afraid the end was imminent. My worst, my worst fear was that I was, was going to lose my daughter. And unexpectedly, what happens the moment after is that all caregivers, all nine of them, described a rapid decrease in distress in what we call the acute phase. Um, to exemplify the experience of all caregivers, I chose this quote. I instantly went to what would my life be like with him there. She, she, this is a, a spouse of a, of a male patient. Uh, like you go really far into the future and then, oh fuck, I've never thought about this before. I may not have a partner at some point. So, which is part of why, as soon as you go there, I dial it all back. Uh, there is a visceral component of this response to trauma and, care, and all caregivers uh, report feeling no emotions at all. Some of them report feeling numb, and numb is a word that I've heard many, many times from caregivers when they describe this stage. The cognitive or behavioral manifestation of this response was similar in all caregivers. They engage in a tunnel vision. Uh, they are only focused on the present. They focus on positive outcomes. They, they uh, employ efforts to avoid distressing thoughts. thoughts. They, they really strive to be positive and they focus on practical tasks. And this uh, almost uh, uh, adaptive dissociation from emotion is really supported by the hospital and, and their social system uh, who have the same approach. Um, for example, to give just a, a few example in the interest of time, uh, this is an example of caregivers really uh, maintaining a positive out. Uh, um, focus on the positives. I'm not even considering that my husband won't beat this. And this is a caregiver of a patient who, were, who was told that they had about 25% chances of surviving. Or other caregivers would say it's probably just gonna be fine. There is a fluctuation out of this numbing state, uh, which is when caregivers witness patient 
going through physical symptoms. And that's where caregivers really talk about uh, feeling terror, which diminishes once the patients go through towards uh, recovery. In this third stage, patients start to come to recover from their physical symptoms, they feel better, and they prepare for discharge. And at this stage, caregivers talk about looking ahead, they start thinking about the future now, now there's attention to self, and this is where emotions like anger or sadness starts to emerge, uh, which are only present in very specific moments of their trajectory, the, in the anticipatory phase and in this last phase. There's almost a window within which caregivers are able to process emotion. And when they arrive to the moment of diagnosis, there is a, um, there's a response from the body who, which pushes distress into what they dis, uh, define as a numb feeling. And this is extremely important to take in consideration when planning for uh, supportive intervention, which have to be flexible and shift from an exploratory to a more supportive stance to support those mechanisms that might be adaptive at this stage. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Kameen. It, it is a very interesting talk and I think it's really uh, a background for making intervention studies in, in the caregivers. Thank, thank you so much. Stein, do you have any comments? Just a few, just a short reflection before we go on break. Uh, I think the last presentation showed us that uh, palliative care research needs lots of methodologies. It needs a broad angle and uh, we really, really need to uh, have uh, a broad focus in order to understand what's going on. And I think this uh, session have reflected it. It's from how you organize palliative care <clears throat> at a national level to uh, run randomized uh, studies, uh, running the feasibility phase, phase two, phase three, etc. And now a more uh, qualitative uh, uh, approach to try to understand what's going on with the family, with the family members, with the carriers, with everyone. So thanks a lot to everyone. Now we have a 10 minute break. We'll be back at 1.45 and we are switching to pain and pain treatment. Looking really forward to see you back uh, in approximately 10 minutes. So take care. Then we move on in the program and I would like to welcome you all to this session which will focus on different aspects of pain treatment. My name is Nina Ost. I'm head of the palliative care unit at Oslo University Hospital and also professor of palliative medicine. And I will chair this session together with my good colleague, Professor Mike Bennett in Leeds. In this session, we will start with the pain ladder and the place for paracetamol in the treatment of cancer pain. And then we will have two presentations regarding opioid misuse and its consequences of long-term opioid treatment. And finally, we will focus on cancer-induced bone pain and the effect of radiotherapy. The first four presentations are all pre-recorded, but luckily the presenters are with us all here today. So after the last presentation, we will have time for questions. I will now introduce the two first speaker, speakers. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Mary Fallon from the University of Edinburgh. Professor Fallon leads the Edinburgh Palliative and Supportive Care Group, and one of the main areas of her research is pain in a broad perspective. We really look forward to a lecture with the title, The Pain Ladder 40 Years On, Evidence for Optimum Global Approach. And the second speaker is Ernulf Paulsen. He works as a palliative care physician at the Telemark Hospital and he's also an associate professor at the University of Oslo. He is asked by the scientific committee to answer the question, do we still need paracetamol? And he will also present the new PRC Parastop study. So then we start with Professor Mary Fallon from Edinburgh, please. Hello everyone, I'm Mary Fallon, Chair of Palliative Medicine at the University of Edinburgh. And today I'd like to present um, the first RCT, in fact, conducted by the PRC. And this is actually elaborating and is based on the three-step WHO analgesic ladder. 
So it's 40 years since we had the initial three-step WHO analgesic ladder. I have uh, no disclosures. And clearly within that time, there has been increasingly significant controversy. Of course, it was um, developed on the basis of consensus of experts and actually was transformational for a number of years in improving cancer pain control on a worldwide basis. However, uh, more recently, there has been great debate about whether or not step two is actually necessary uh, or in fact, if it's detrimental. And of course, this is in the background of the fact that globally, the majority of the world actually has very poor access to opioid analgesia. We've known for some time that uh, the second step is associated with a need to progress to step three quite quickly. And the majority of studies quote something in the region of 50% um, within or at the two week point. There have been a number of studies, uh, including um, RCTs, um, that have been published in support of strong opioids and opioid naive patients and missing out step two. But none of these studies have actually been definitive or persuasive enough in themselves to leave out step two of the WHO ladder. So the PRC um, initially um, with the idea of Professor Jeff Hanks um, were very keen to explore this on an international basis. Do we actually need the second step? And so we embarked on an international multi-center open randomized parallel group trial in patients with cancer pain who are at the point of requiring at least step two opioid analgesia. And we compared a two-step approach with the standard three-step approach. I mentioned this was an international study and we had several centers in the UK. We had Israel, we had Mexico, Mexico City and Uganda, uh, Kampala. The trial arms consisted of the experimental arm was the new two-step approach and participants commenced on the proved strong opioid and this was titrated as per local practice. And for practical reasons, this was morphine or oxycodone. The control arm consisted of the standard three-step approach and participants were commenced on an approved weak opioid. If pain control were not achieved on this, i.e. the average pain remained higher or equal to four out of 10, then patients would commence on a strong opioid. And the standard opioids in the control arm at step two were codeine or tramadol in the doses noted. The inclusion criteria for the study were adults over 18 years old, a diagnosis of active cancer. The pain had to be cancer related, not cancer treatment related or any non-malignant cause, but cancer related. And the average pain score at entry into study had to be at least four out of 10 um, and requiring step two. And clearly patients had to be able to comply with the trial procedures. So by definition, they had to be well enough generally to take part in the study. The exclusion criteria are all around patients who are not well enough to take part in the study, had had recent access to step three opioids, or in fact, um, were undergoing treatment uh, either before or during the study that might in fact change their pain and therefore make it very difficult to assess the impact of the actual study. This was a 20-day study, 20-day follow-up, and the primary outcome was the time to achieving stable pain control. And that was defined as three consecutive days with a pain of less than or equal to three out of 10. Clearly, in a study like this, the equipoise is all important. And uh, it goes without saying that opioid-related side effects were the equipoise in this study and were examined uh, very carefully 
uh, with each patient. The secondary outcomes were distress using the distress thermometer, other pain measures um, that we can see here, and of course costs were very important, um, particularly because uh, this is a global study and included low and middle income countries, and we'll come back to that. The baseline and endpoint assessments were as follows. The worst than average pain in the last 24 hours, the brief pain inventory, the distress thermometer, analgesic use, opioids and non-opioids, non-analgesic medication, and of course, opioid toxicity and opioid side effects. And from the point of view of the cost analysis, EQ5D. During the trial every day, the patient um, completed a diary with average pain, worse pain, and how much opioid they use, both regular and any breakthrough. And then every second day, they completed non-analgesic medication in addition to the above and side effects. And then mid-study, day 10, and again at the end, day 20, all of the above were completed, plus the distress thermometer, EQ5D, and the BPI. This is the consort diagram, and you can see that um, we screened over 2,000 patients um, for study eligibility. And out of the um, 2,194 patients, uh, you can see that 153 were actually randomised. Um, the majority were uh, excluded because uh, they didn't meet the inclusion criteria. And within that, uh, there were a number of patients who had pains that um, did not relate to uh, their cancer. Um, and there were, of course, a number of patients who'd been using a significant amount of PRN opioid. So those that were opioid naive, um, they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either the experimental arm, the two-step approach, or the control arm, the standard three-step approach. So 77 patients went into the experimental arm, 76 into the control arm. Um, and those lost to follow up in both arms were just four, which was um, good. And 73 um, had data for analysis in the experimental arm and 72 in the control arm. We can see the demographics um, really um, appropriately um, distributed um, between arms and also um, between countries. And from the, we put Israel together with the UK, and you can see that um, the UK recruited the largest number of patients, um, followed um, by Uganda and then Mexico. And there was, of course, a standard expected distribution uh, of malignancies. Now, the primary outcome. Um, you can see here that actually, um, whether you were in the two-step arm or the three-step arm, i.e. experimental or control group, the time to achieving stable pain control um, overall was the same. If, however, you look at the control arm, we can see that um, a number of patients, more than half, had to, in fact, switch to a strong opioid. Um, uh, the median time for this was actually day, day six. Um, and you can see there, of course, the Kaplan-Meier curve does separate significantly um, because of uh, increased number of days with uncontrolled pain um, in the interim be, before the switch. If we look at the study equipoise, which is uh, very interesting and to some extent unexpected, but in fact, the odds ratio of suffering from nausea was almost three times um, higher. You're three times more likely to have nausea if you were in the control arm compared to the experimental arm. So three-step approach, there was more nausea um, and there was more of a variety of other side effects, um, but less dramatic than nausea, but these included vomiting. 
Um, and so we can see that from the point of view of the study equipoise, there was absolutely no increase in opioid-related side effects if you move directly from step one to a strong opioid um, compared to going through the standard three-step approach. Economic analysis is very important, bearing in mind has no access to opioid analgesia. And um, in the UK, we were able to do a full economic analysis. However, um, with the data available to us, we could only do a, a cost analysis uh, in Uganda and Mexico. So if we look uh, at the bottom of this table that really summarises medication costs, you can see um, the first column is the UK, and um, again in the control arm, there were excess costs of drugs, and this was predominantly due to uh, managing side effects in those uh, using the standard three-step approach. Um, in Mexico, um, you can see that again the costs were almost four times as much in the control arm, so using the standard three-step approach, because weak opioids are so expensive in comparison to strong opioids in, in um, most low- and mid middle-income countries, certainly Mexico. And the same very much applies um, for Uganda. If you look at Ugandan shillings here, you can see that uh, we've got almost nine times the cost in the three-step arm, the control arm, compared to the experimental arm. Again, because of the huge cost of weak opioids. If we look at the quality adjusted life days for the UK population, you could see again, it was better in the experimental arm. And the eyes are for UK patients for the experimental arm dominated the control arm. Um, and you can see the uh, cost here. It was um, five pounds, uh, 17 pence less per quality. And that from the combination of more effective and less costly intervention. And the probability that the two-step ladder is cost effective in the UK is above 70%. So just to summarize, um, we can see the evidence shows that there are no advantages of the three-step over the two-step approach from the patient's point of view. There do seem, however, to be several advantages of a two-step over a three-step approach. The first is the side effects are higher with the standard three-step approach. And this is very interesting to discuss. Over half of patients in the three-step arm had to switch from a weak opioid to strong opioid, and the median time was day six. There are clearly practicalities around this in many countries, and particularly in low- and middle-income countries. This was, you know, gold standard management within a controlled trial. Patients wouldn't normally have access to such efficient switching, um, particularly in um, you know, resource poor countries. And the two-step approach is clearly cheaper than the three-step in all countries. Um, and this isn't even considering uh, the cost to the patient of traveling uh, long distances, um, particularly again in low and middle income countries. So uh, these findings are of importance and they're particularly important from the global point of view. So we'd obviously like to thank all the participants um, and acknowledge um, everyone in the study team um, and, of course, Professor Geoffrey Hanks, who initially conceived the idea of evaluating uh, in a rigorous fashion a two-step versus three-step approach. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Ulrich uh, Paulsen. I'm working in Sweden, Norway. I am presenting a project we've been planning for the last eight months, the Parastop, the Paracetamol with Strong Opioids study. This is a 
randomized double blind non inferiority withdrawal trial of paracetamol versus placebo in conjunction with opioids for moderate to severe cancer related pain. The European Palliative Care Research Center ran in February a Delphi round in the cancer pain group where the energetic efficacy of paracetamol was one of the highest ranked research questions of interest among the pain experts. The study takes advantage of the PRC's international collaborators as uh, our Edinburgh group has provided the pilot study for the trial. Paracetamol is recommended in the WHO's energetic ladder on step one or in combination with opioids on step two and three. These recommendations are the basis of our treatment of cancer-related pain worldwide. And we published a paper that confirmed that paracetamol is used by 45 to 60% of patients with cancer using strong opioids in UK and Sweden and Norway. However, this was in contrast to only 10% of patients in Italy indicating that the use of paracetamol together with strong opioids differs between centers and countries. Systematic reviews have found insufficient evidence of, to support the use of paracetamol in combination with strong opioids, and only a few and small randomized controlled trials were identified. A recently published pragmatic practice review for the management of cancer pain stated that oral paracetamol should not routinely be used for patients who are already taking a strong opioid for cancer pain. The aim of this study is to establish whether paracetamol is beneficial for pain treatment when used together with strong opioids for cancer-related pain. As this is a non-inferiority withdrawal study, this could also be formulated as we want to establish whether placebo, that is paracetamol withdrawal, provides non-inferior, that is not much worse, analgesia compared to continued paracetamol when used together with strong opioids. Mary Fallon and her group in Edinburgh performed this pilot study in 2017. This was also a randomized controlled withdrawal trial of seven days duration. The study included 34 participants of which 28 were evaluated. There was no change in average pain intensity between the groups at evaluation on day eight. The study demonstrated the feasibility of the study design of a paracetamol withdrawal trial. For our, our study, the screening will be performed at hospital-based oncology and palliative care outpatient clinics. Participants are using paracetamol and strong opioids at inclusion and are randomized one-to-one -to, -one to continued paracetamol or placebo and will receive identically looking capsules or tablets. The intervention period is seven days. Participants will meet in person for baseline evaluation, including blood samples for serum paracetamol, opioids and cytokines. Daily assessments will be recorded in a diary and participants will receive a daily telephone call from study nurses on weekdays. They will meet again in person for assessment on day eight and blood samples will be collected for opioids and cytokines. Finally, participants will receive a follow-up telephone from nurse study nurses between day 10 and 14. This is an overview of the study timeline. The intervention period is seven days. The inclusion criteria are 
adult patients with metastatic cancer with more than two months expected survival and receiving regular strong opioids for cancer pain and paracetamol one gram four times daily. And finally, with average pain intensity between two and seven on a numerical rating scale. The sample size estimation is based on a non-inferiority margin of one point on a zero to 10 numerical rating scale. This represents 50% of minimum clinically important difference. To our judgment, clinicians would probably consider to withdraw paracetamol in clinical practice if the effect size was less than one point. Based on data from the pilot trial, a sample size of 89 patients in each arm was estimated and we will include 102 participants in each treatment arm to allow for dropouts. The primary endpoint in the study is average pain intensity measured by a numerical rating scale 0 to 10 on day 8. The secondary endpoints include patient-reported opioid-related side effects, the patient global impression of change, and opioid consumption all reported on day 8. The trial is organized through the European Palliative Care Research Center, and the trial inclusion period is estimated to be two years. We are planning to start the first centers within the next six months. Eight international and Norwegian study centers will take part. If you should be interested in participating in the study, please get in contact. My email address is displayed on the slide. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions regarding the study later in this session. Thanks to Mary Fallon and Ernulf Paulsen for very nice and interesting presentations. We will now have a five minutes break and then we will go on to two more presentations and then a short discussion. Thank you so far. Uh, welcome back everybody. Uh, uh, we have two more speakers in the next session. Uh, the first uh, lecture is from Professor Per Sjogren, and he's going to talk about opioid misuse in cancer care and overview. And that's going to be followed by Gina Carita, who's going to describe a new PRC study on adverse effects and consequences of long-term opioid treatment. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to give this talk on the PRC meeting. My topic is opioid use in cancer care, and it is an overview. After me, uh, Gina Kurita will give a, a talk on a protocol uh, concerning the same subject. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. There's a lot of concepts and definitions surrounding iatrogenic opioid addiction. Terms like opioid abuse, misuse, opioid dependence, aberrant opioid behavior, problematic opioid use, non-medical opioid use, opioid use disorders, and chemical coping. Further, the definitions surrounding opioid addictions are many. There's the general ones, DMS-5, ICD-11, but there's also more specific ones. But let's start with the WHO analgesic ladder. It's a general worldwide concept to treat cancer-related pain, and it has been broadly used all over the world with a huge success in patients with cancer. However, Step two and step three opioids on the ladder and the principles of the ladder has also spread to chronic non-malignant pain. The consequences of this can be seen in this editorial for BMJ in 2016, 
with the title WHO Analgesic Ladder, a Good Concept Going Astray. I quote Valentine and Calzo, the success of opioid treatment in terminally ill cancer patients set the stage for extending the same treatment principles to the treatment of chronic pain where previously opioids were considered too risky or not effective. And I will continue quoting the editorial. Over the past 30 years in much of the developed world, we have seen more patients treated with opioids at higher doses than ever before. The extent to which the more liberal use of opioid would cause harm was not predicted. Thus, this editorial is actually referring to the opioid epidemic in the United States. And this started actually in the late 90s with a wave of overdose death involving prescription opioids. It was due to immoral and reckless marketing from the industry. And later on, this epidemic was fueled by two waves of uh, illicit use of opioids, a heroin wave in 2010, and a synthetic opioid wave in 2013, comprising uh, the illegal use of fentanyl. But actually, the evidence for overprescribing opioids in chronic non-cancer pain was stemming from population-based studies, which, first of all, due to the length of the studies and also to the real environment, demonstrated that datugenic opioid-related abuse occurred in more than 20% of patients. Further, and interestingly, the long-term use of opioids had poor analgesic outcomes and negative health effects. We also did studies in chronic non-malignant pain patients, and we used the Danish Health and Mobility Service, which already started in the late 80s, and we have carried on with these surveys until now. The purpose of these surveys is to describe and monitor the status and trends of health and mobility in the adult Danish population. And we embarked on these huge surveys characterizing chronic pain uh, with being uh, longer than six months. Further, we combine, combine these data with uh, our prescription national registry. And we could demonstrate throughout uh, the years, and you can see the reference in the bottom of this slide, that long-term use of opioids in non-cancer pain was associated with high pain intensity, low functional capacity, and poor quality of life. Actually, the three key objects you want to achieve with long-term opioid treatment. Further, we demonstrated poor self-rated health and sleep, low odds of recovery from chronic pain. Chronic pain is actually not always chronic pain. And in line with the US studies, higher risk of injuries, poisoning, and all-cause mortality, lack of or low sexual desire, and as other population-based studies, indi indicators of addictive behaviors was demonstrated in more than 20% of the population. So one response, apart from regulative initiatives, was to write opioid guidelines as a response to the opioid crisis. And the most well-known one is the US uh, guideline uh, from Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. But there was also a Canadian guideline, there's a Norwegian guideline demonstrated here, and a Danish guideline demonstrated as examples of uh, guidelines for responsible opioid prescribing in chronic non-cancer pain. However, turning to the cancer arena, we also have recent guidelines of pain and opioid management in cancer. 
uh, one of the first of the recent guidelines was the EAPC opioid guidelines from 2012, and the latest one is the new WHO guideline from 2019. Common features for these guidelines on pain and opioid management is that they are evidence-based, they are based on GRADE or other systems, there's an international cons consensus surrounding them, and they can be adapted to local needs worldwide. They recognize that opioids are essential treatment of moderate to severe cancer pain. They also recognize that there's a lack of availability and accessibility of opioids in low-income countries, and that there's an overuse of opioids in some high-income countries. And they are dealing with the general principles of opioid management, including side effects like constipation, nausea and vomiting, sedation, cognitive dysfunction, hyperalgesia, and to some extent, addiction. However, there may be some common features of long-term opioid exposure in humans, and where are the issues? So one of them is actually addiction, but there's also long-term consequences like physical dependence, tolerance development, opioid-induced hyperalgesia, cognitive dysfunction, and also new areas like the opioid suppression of the immune and reproductive systems. And we have to consider some of these issues when we look at opioid therapy in cancer care. Actually, opioid therapy in cancer care is going on in a changing environment. First of all, the changing trajectories of the cancer diseases. Secondly, earlier palliative care intervention that has been described in a number of RCTs recently and also new data on diatrogenic opioid addiction in cancer patients. First of all, the five-year overall survival has risen steadily for most common tumors, both in Europe and in North America. However, chronic pain is still a prevalent problem in patients both on the curative treatment but also in advanced and terminal stages of the cancer diseases. Furthermore, there's a growing population of patients with chronic long-term trajectories of disease and also a growing population of cancer survivors with very high prevalences of chronic pain. Secondly, earlier palliative care intervention will challenge the palliative care specialist with longer trajectories and longer pain trajectories and opioid treatment. And finally, the prevalence of opioid addiction in patients with cancer may be higher than we formerly expected. This study from Eduardo Pereira's group that was published in Cancer in 2018 demonstrated in cancer patients in supportive care using an instrument that is screening for non-medical use of opioids that almost 20% of the patients had an aberrant behavior related to opioid use. That is of the same magnitude that is found in other studies in chronic non-cancer pain patients. Here is a Danish study by uh, Jette Heuster demonstrated and an Israeli study by Feingold demonstrated where they also, using other screening instruments, found around 20% of patients having uh, an aberrant behavior related to long-term opioid use. So based on the changing trajectories in cancer, we may need new recommendation for opioid guidelines in cancer care. Opioids should still be considered the gold standard analgesics. However, some of these points may be followed in the new assessment. Patients need to be assessed meticulously uh, before starting opioid therapy. The pain syndrome assessment is very important 
as we can make drop priorities. We should consider neuropathic pain in this sense. We need to screen all patients with validated risk assessment tools. However, there's no consensus on these tools yet. We need to educate patients and staff, and we need also to set up goal setting for the outcomes of the opioid treatment. We need to select drugs and we need to be cautious with fast acting opioids like fentanyl. We need to monitor the patients in the long run with prescription drug databases, but also patient's behavior. And finally, if treatment goes wrong, we need to have exit programs to taper off patients in a passionate way. And we need also to give patients evidence-based treatment of addiction if addiction occurs. Thank you very much for listening. My name is Gina Curita, and I'm a senior researcher at His Hospitality Copenhagen University Hospital in Denmark. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to present this proposal for a multicenter study regarding aberrant behavior and other consequences of long-term opioid treatment in patients with cancer pain. This project idea was developed by professors Per Sugren, Marie Fallon, and I, and this proposal has been discussed with some research colleagues, and hopefully others will be interested in joining our team. The worldwide opioid prescribing rates for chronic and cancer pain are still high, despite the weak evidence regarding the benefits of long-term opioid treatment. With the high rates, it has been observed potential iatrogenic opioid effects in chronic and cancer pain patients as aberrant behavior connects to the possibility of opioid abuse, misuse and addiction, cognitive dysfunction, and suppression of immune and endocrine systems. All the knowledge that has been developed regarding iatrogenic opioid effects in chronic and cancer pain is raising concerns that they can also occur in patients with cancer pain in long-term opioid treatment. Nowadays, patients with cancer live longer and the survival rates are higher than before due to advances in the diagnostic methods and treatments, which may also prolong the opioid treatment for cancer-related pain. Therefore, with the widespread of opioid use and an improvement of anti-cancer therapies, there is a growing interest in studying the effects of long-term opioid treatment in cancer patients. All information generated from studies regarding long-term opioid treatment can contribute to expand our knowledge and understand of the benefits and risks of opioid use in different situations and to develop recommendations to guide the clinical practice. This project is based on two hypotheses. First, if a systematic assessment of opioid aberrant behavior is performed in cancer patients in long-term opioid treatment, we'll find patients at increased risk of opioid misuse. And second, if systematic assessments of immune endocrine systems are performed, we'll find patients with suppression of these systems. Possibly, long-term opioid treatment is associated with increased risk for opioid misuse and suppression of immune and endocrine systems, which may reduce the quality of life of patients with cancer. This is a proposal for a multinational cross-sectional study, which will include outpatients and inpatients in long-term opioid treatment at specialist oncology and or palliative services. And it is composed by two sub-projects. So the project one is about opioid misuse. The primary objective is to identify the prevalence of opioid misuse risk by the pain medication questionnaire among patients with cancer-related pain in long-term opioid treatment. The secondary objective is to analyze associations between opioid misuse risk and social demographic characteristics, clinical and treatment variables, and health indicators like quality of life and addictive factors. Subi Project 2 is regarding the effects on immune and endocrine systems. Primary objectives are to examine 
associations between long-term opioid treatment in terms of duration of treatment, dose and type of opioid, and immune system suppression, and also endocrine system suppression in patients with cancer-related pain. The secondary objective is to explore relationships between immune system, endocrine system, social demographic characteristics, clinical and treatment variables, and health indicators. Inclusion criteria for both projects are patients with a clinical diagnosis of active cancer, age of at least 18 years old, and treatment with at least 30 mg of morphine equivalents per day for the last three months. The exclusion criteria are patients who do not master the national language at the study center in speech and writing, poor general health condition in which it is estimated that the questionnaire would be a strain on the patient, participation in other studies interfering with this study, and unable to provide an informed consent. To be included in Super Project 2, the patient should also provide a blood sample. We made some simple calculations based on formula for prevalence studies. And consider a prevalence of opioid addiction of 7% in patients with cancer, the sample of Subproject 1 would be composed by 300 patients. If there are six participating centers, each one would provide 50 patients, for instance. For Subproject 2, we have considered the prevalence of hypogonadism of 90% in cancer patients in opioid treatment, which would result in a sample of 139 patients. Of course, these numbers are an attempt and they can be revised. Most of the details of the study conduction are being discussed. However, it should be simple and easy to execute in the different centers. There will be only one assessment for each patient that can occur any time of the day, and it is expected to have a duration no longer than one hour. Eligible patients will be referred by their clinical care team to the research team in each participating center. They will be screened according to inclusion and exclusion criteria, and if appropriate, offered information about the study and invited to participate. Patients will answer the self-assessment questionnaires, which are the pain medication questionnaire regarding risk of opioid misuse, addictive behavior indicators about smoking, alcohol, illicit drugs, among others, the RTC questionnaires on symptoms, functionality, health-related quality of life, a list of opioid toxicity and side effects, hospital anxiety and depression scale, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network's Distress Thermometer, and the Sexual Desire Questionnaire. Patients in the Subproject 2 are those from Subproject 1 that agreed to provide a blood sample. Blood sample should be collected in the morning between 7 and 10 a.m. Patients that do not wish to provide the blood sample can still participate in the Subproject 1 and complete the questionnaires. The immune and endocrine tests are being discussed, but we have several hints from literature about which cells, inflammatory markers, proteins, and hormones, among others, should be investigated. Here we have some examples of the immune tests and the endocrine tests. As you can see, we have many possibilities and we are open for discussion. Last, I would like to mention some details about this project. The study has to be approved by local scientific ethic committee, authority agencies, and individual management at participating institutions will follow regulations for data protection. Collaborators can submit proposals for analysis of subsets of the data. Informed consent will be elaborated in the language of each participating center. Patients can withdraw consent to participate in the study as they wish at any time. 
and the protocol, the informed consent forms, and the rationale of clinical research will be discussed with researchers from the collaborating centers, and we will also include the patient representation. I'm looking forward to hearing your comments and suggestions, and thank you very much for your attention. Um, well, thank you to all our speakers in the last session, Marie, Ornolf, uh, Pear and Gina. Um, uh, uh, we now have five minutes um, for questions to the speakers and I'm following the chat box uh, live. And if anyone wants to, uh, uh, there are a couple of themes that are, have come up from that, which I will present to the speakers. But if, if there are any particular questions others in the audience would like to put to the speakers, now is your chance. One of the um, themes that I think has come up um, is the, uh, in, in, it's, it's almost um, in contrasting between some, some of the speakers, which is um, Marie's talk and trial has argued for uh, bypassing the coding step of the WHO ladder and going straight on strong opioids. And I know there has been some comments in the chat about whether uh, that is the right thing to do, given the um, anxieties about um, starting people on opioids. And of course, Pear and Gina's work uh, has highlighted the potential risks of long-term opioids. And I wondered if we could just explore that a little bit um, in terms of the difference between patients with advanced disease and patients on uh, with a much longer prognosis on opioids. Um, Marie, I know you've been answering some of the texts, uh, some of the messages in the column, and I wondered if you just wanted to expand on some of your answers that you've provided. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, all your questions. Um, I think it's important to say a couple of key uh, issues, and the first is that on a worldwide basis, the majority of patients do not have access to any analgesia either weak opioid or strong opioid. And certainly in low middle income countries, there's a huge issue with access to uh, strong opioids. And weak opioids, as you can see, are hugely expensive. The idea of the two-step versus three-step study is, is not to actually um, uh, facilitate the use of opioids in patients where it's not appropriate. Um, the idea is to make sure that uh, patients who have advanced cancer and cancer-related pain, um, who are terminally ill uh, and who have uncontrolled pain, have access to the most efficient analgesia uh, possible. And all the way along, it's up to the clinician to minimize side effects. And, you know, as I've said in the chat, we would never propose just using opioids. It has to be balanced, balanced analgesia using uh, other uh, pharmacological approaches as appropriate. And of course, using the non-drug uh, approaches that um, contribute to balanced analgesia. Um, I would say that, you know, what um, Gina and Pierre have presented is not at odds with the two-step versus three-step study is complementary. And what we're facing on a worldwide basis, initiated in the US, and that's a whole other issue why that started, is often the inappropriate use of opioids. Um, and what we're proposing uh, is at least an advanced cancer with, a, with significant pain, that patients should be treated appropriately. And obviously, all the usual assessments would be in, in place. So this two-step approach is not for non-malignant pain. It's not for cancer treatment-related pain. Um, so I and, I and I think some of the pharmacology came up in the chat box. We have to remember 10% of the population um, can actually metabolize codeine anyway, so we're giving them inefficient analgesia from the beginning. Um, and we did show very clearly in the study that the equipoise was met in that there was absolutely no increase in side effects, and if anything, there was significantly less nausea when you miss out step two and go straight to more efficient analgesia with low-dose opioid. So I'm sure the area will remain controversial, but I think it's important that we take an integrated approach to it, and it's not at odds 
with the other areas that we have to evolve and understand in um, cancer pain treatment, um, which of course is identifying those patients who may be susceptible to abuse. Thank you, Mary. Um, Pear and Gina, I wondered if you wanted to pick up on some of that. In your studies, you've highlighted the mechanisms by which opioids might impact um, long-term health. But one of the questions that has come up is how strong is the evidence uh, uh, in relation to survival and long-term opioids? In other words, do long-term opioids shorten survival in patients with cancer? I don't think we have any data on that, Mike. And uh, but it's clear as as trajectories are changing radically, and and that's a very good thing in 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 ca in cancer. I think it is justified to start to invest some of the long term consequences of opioid use, and maybe as I did, uh, the comparison to the non malignant population is not very good. But uh, here we have some experiences with, with some of the biological effects of opioids in the long term run. And I know that, that Gina is also sitting in a working group in, under ASCO now that is looking into long term use of opioids in cancer patients. Actually, we have very little data on that. It was a little bit of worrying data that came out from Eduardo Barrera's group, and I think this can be quite different in, in, in other places than European countries. And I think quite recently we heard about uh, Sebastian uh, Mercadante elaborating on, on the use in Sicily. And actually there was underuse of opioids in, in cancer patients in, in Sicily. So even within the, within the European uh, Union, so to speak, uh, we, have, uh, we have probably huge differences in, in opioid use. But that should not abstain us from investigating these issues because it may be a problem in, in, in some countries. And, and by the way, we need more knowledge about the long-term use in this population. Thank you, Pam. I think there was a question also for you, Nulf, about the Parastop study. We have time for that, I hope. A short question. Yes, let's do that. Ernulf, um, I don't know the scientific basis for, uh, but it's said that paracetamol reduced the consumption of strong opioids, and it suggested uh, that this should be a primary outcome in, in the study. Do you have any comments to that? Uh, we have chosen to, to use the, the analgesia, uh, the, the, the level of pain as, as the main outcome, but the, the opioid level is, is the secondary outcome. And uh, like Mary Fallon discussed in the, the two versus three step study, uh, the, the, the balance of the, the side effects will be an, an, an uh, important outcome in this pragmatic study, um, I think. Great. So I think it's time that we moved on to our final um, speakers in this session. And I'd, be, uh, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Ragnild Habersad, who's going to talk about what is the prior study and its recent results. Uh, and then that will be followed by Yvette van der Linden, who's going to talk about what are the Dutch studies and their recent results. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. My name is Ragnil Habersta. I work as an oncologist uh, at St. Olaf's Hospital in Trondheim, and I'm also a PhD candidate uh, at the PRC. I will present the first study, uh, first uh, paper on the PRAY study, uh, Clinical Predictors for Analgesic Response to Radiotherapy in Patients with Painful Bone Metastasis. Yeah. You can go on, oh, yeah, thanks. Radiotherapy. We know that radiotherapy reduces pain in percent of patients with painful bone metastasis. Uh, we know little about which patients that are more likely to respond to radiotherapy. There are two large studies that have investigated multiple clinical predictors for radiotherapy response. Um, both of them are from the Netherlands, and I guess we're going to hear more about at least one of the two studies later today. 
Uh, common for the two studies is that patients with breast or prostate cancer and patients with better performance status had significantly better response rates. Uh, other factors that were significant in one of the two studies were higher baseline pain intensity, absence of visceral metastasis, the use of opioids, and younger age. Common for studies on uh, radiotherapy response and, and predictors for radiotherapy response is that the discriminative ability of the studies are quite low, so there must be something else as well. Uh, additional factors that may be important to predict radiotherapy response may be radiological findings. Uh, a few studies have also investigated osteoclast biomarkers in the urine. Um, we know also that inflammation is important in cancer-induced bone pain and maybe also pain intensity. It might also be important in uh, response to radiotherapy. But, uh, however, you can click once. <laughs> um, uh, but by now, there are no clinical markers that are applicable for clinical use. Uh, and the lack of studies that are primarily designed to evaluate radiotherapy response for cancer bone pain warranted a prospective study designed to identify multiple predictors for radiotherapy response. And that's what we have done in the PRAY study. Okay? Yes, just go on. Uh, the PRAY study is an international longitudinal observational multicenter study with a primary aim to assess predictors for analgesic radiotherapy response in patients with painful bone metastasis. In this study, we included adult patients with a verified cancer diagnosis that were about to undergo radiotherapy with a palliative intent for painful bone metastasis. The study was uh, initiated by Paul Klepsta and had been coordinated by PRC here in Trondheim, Norway, with me as uh, the coordinating uh, PhD candidate. Uh, patients were recruited from seven oncological centers across Europe from December 2013 to December 2017. Yeah. Move on. Yeah. The primary outcome was analgesic radiotherapy response in patients with painful bone metastasis. The response definition was minimum a two-point decrease in worst pain score at the irradiated site without increase in analgetic use or reduction in opioid dose of at least 25% from baseline without an increase in pain score at the irradiated site. Pain scores was recorded, self-reported and recorded in an 11-point numeric rating scale. Uh, and response rates were record, recorded within eight weeks after the last radiotherapy fraction. For the statistics, we used multivariate logistic regression analysis with multiple imputation of missing data. We chose 17 independent and potentially relevant variables. Uh, we added those uh, variables that were known from before. And in addition, we added the radi radiological characteristics if the patients had sclerotic or osteolytic metastasis, and also if there was a soft tissue component. Uh, we recorded a little bit more detail about medications, including the use of corticosteroids, um, and we also added, uh, took a lot of blood tests and included CRP as a gross measure of inflammation in this clinical study. Uh, patients that were missing the radiotherapy response, uh, they were excluded from analysis after imputation. Yeah. So to the exciting part, uh, the results. Uh, we enrolled 574 patients in our study. A few patients could not be included in analysis due to various reasons, and that included that seven, 27 patients that reported a worst pain score less than two by inclusion, and also 27 patients that died before the first evaluation three weeks after radiotherapy. So of the 513 patients included uh, in analysis, 44% responded to radiotherapy, 46% did not respond to radiotherapy, and 10% had an unknown radiotherapy response. You can click uh, continue a few times now. Uh, thank you. Yeah. The mean age was 66.2 years. They were a little bit more male than female. Uh, the main cancer diagnosis were prostate, breast, lung, and gastrointestinal. Uh, and maybe the most surprising finding was that 
so many as 63% as of patients received multiple fraction radiotherapy, while only 37% received single fraction radiotherapy. Yeah, you can go on. So, for the multivariable model. Compared or in common with findings with the two other previously published papers, we found that better performance status and a primary diagnosis of breast and prostate cancer uh, was significantly predictors for radiotherapy response. What we also found is that patients with soft tissue expansion outside bone had significantly better response rates. And in addition, and maybe a bit surprising, I don't know <laughs> what you think, uh, that corticosteroid was an, corticosteroids was a negative predictor for radiotherapy response. The discriminative ability of the model, it was uh, uh, quite okay, uh, with uh, C statistics of 0 0.69. Okay. So, can our findings be used to select patients with painful bone metastasis to receive or not to receive radiotherapy? Well, uh, the discriminative ability of the model, uh, model it was moderate, uh, um, and see statistic, it was actually higher than in some of the previously published analysis on this topic. Um, and we have discussed a lot in our group and also with a senior statistician, if we were to, to do a clinical risk score uh, to predict radiotherapy response. But in order to be clinically useful, a such risk score should give like a certain cutoff value which reliably discriminate patients. Uh, and we found that this is not a feature available in previous studies nor in our study. So we choose not to develop a specific predictive score for radiotherapy response. But uh, we and others have identified several clinical features with, which uh, I think uh, the clinicians should take into consideration when they are planning radiotherapy. I think performance status is it's probably one of the most important predictive, uh, predictive variables for the therapy response. Uh, I think this figure is quite illustrative and, uh, and I, I, if you don't use it in a clinic, just uh, save it in the back of your mind, uh, at least for you working as clinicians and oncologists. Uh, um, if you see this picture, you can see that patients with a high Karnofsky status, uh, let's say 90%, uh, percent, um, has a response rate in about 70%, while patients with a low Karnofsky status uh, score has, uh, let's say, 40 to 50%, only have a 20 to 30% response rate. So that's a huge different difference. Okay. When it comes to cancer diagnosis uh, and soft tissue expansion, these are uh, features are very important, but I think it's very difficult to select patients for radiotherapy based on these features uh, alone. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then it comes to inflammation, and that's really exciting, I think. Uh, we found that patients at the baseline, patients that did not respond to radiotherapy actually had a higher baseline CRP score, but it was not significant in the multivariable model. But, but CRP is a very crude measure of inflammation. When it comes to steroid, corticosteroids, we know that corticosteroids reduce inflammation and it may also induce, uh, uh, reduce an incidence of pain flares in radiotherapy. Uh, in this study, it was a negative predictor for radiotherapy response with a 57% lower odds uh, for a, a radiotherapy response. There might be uh, several explanation for it, explanations for it, but um, one might, might be that the anti-inflammatory effect of uh, radiotherapy is already induced by the corticosteroids, which then again reduces the additional effect of radiotherapy. Or it might be that the local inflammation is necessary for the tumor uh, effect and uh, our immune system to eradicate the tumor after radiotherapy. Uh, and if it is like that, uh, maybe uh, corticosteroids should be avoided during radiotherapy. So that, that's very interesting, I think, and a, a topic for discussion. Um, yes, you can continue to the next slide. So, in the conclusion, uh, we found that patients with better performance status, breast or prostate cancer, and the presence of soft tissue expansion outside bone had significantly better response rates 
while patients using corticosteroids had significantly lower response rates. And these findings can be useful as a clinical decision support, and especially for you working as clinicians and oncologists around the world. Uh, in our study, only 37% of the patients received single fraction treatments. Uh, I, I mean, that is too low. We all know that uh, multiple fraction regimes and single fractions regimes have the same response rates, um, and it must be obviously beneficial for both pa patients and the healthcare system to receive single fraction regimes. Okay, uh, that's me. Thank you for your attention. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Yvette van der Linde and I will try to share my presentation with you. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Um, okay, so um, I will give you an overview of the Dutch studies on bone metastasis um, and highlight some of the outcome of those studies. And I can only highlight because here you see that we have a lot of studies performed uh, in the last 20 years in the Netherlands and it's all close collabor collaboration with a lot of, uh, of our colleagues uh, from the 21 institutes that are doing radiotherapy in the Netherlands. Um, so I will go through all of these studies, highlight some of them and if you want to have a deeper look at them you can go and see. There are a lot of publications uh, there. Uh, and a lot of these um, researchers are all PhD candidates who have already performed their PhDs. Um, so this is the first slide and then I will show you the second slide because these are the, all the other studies that we are uh, have performed, have finished or are still ongoing. Some of them are still uh, ongoing. <laughs> Welcome back everybody. Uh, I'm sorry that we've lost uh, Yvette and we can't bring her back just now, but um, that does give us a few extra minutes for discussion um, before we uh, turn for the break. Um, I'm going to start the discussion by inviting Augusto Caraceni, um, who had a question for Ragnhild. Augusto. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ragnhild, for your interesting presentation. Indeed, uh, radiation therapy is a very important tool to relieve bone pain. Uh, the association with dexamethasone uh, with the corticosteroids and uh, poor result, uh, I think you should consider it carefully. We have data from prospective trials that uh, the corticosteroids are effective to relieve pain flares. We have data from trials on uh, spinal cord compression, all the data from Denmark, I think, uh, showing that uh, it is helpful to give uh, corticosteroids when you suspect or you have uh, epidural invasion. Uh, don't you think that it is possible that the association uh, is uh, related to the fact that maybe patients with the worse pain who are receiving corticosteroids uh, post hoc, in the sense that they were indeed uh, uh, requiring more medication uh, in the sense uh, since you do not have a prospective uh, uh, control of the use of dexamethasone uh, in uh, your case series? This is the question. Thank you very much for the comment and the question, Augusto. I, I totally agree with you uh, and, and we should take these uh, findings with corticosteroids as, as a negative predictor for radiotherapy with, with really like big precautions and also a big disadvantage with this study is that we didn't have the corticosteroid dose and type. Actually, we had it in a few patients, but not enough to include that as a variable. Uh, and and, uh, and that, that, that might also have affected the results. So I, I totally agree with you. Uh, but I thought the uh, findings were interesting and, and it might be something to work uh, with uh, further and for further, subs further sub studies. Daniel, I have a question for you um, from a clinical point of view. I know you are a PhD student now, but do you know if the results of the PRESS study have led to any changes in the radiotherapy of patients with bone metastasis in your hospital? Um, uh, uh, I think about the results of the PRACE study, uh, we have not re really published the results yet, but, but I've presented it for the doctors and I think especially uh, the uh, thinking about uh, if we are to um, 
plan for a single or multiple fraction radiotherapy. I think uh, this study made them aware that we are still stuck in our old habits uh, and patients are, uh, yeah, should have been be offered single fraction radiotherapy more, I think. And when it comes to, to the other uh, issues and it, when it comes to Karnofsky status, uh, I don't really know. Uh, but, but I think that's also interesting to have in mind uh, when you work as a clinical doctor uh, in the field uh, to really think twice if the patients are in a, in a bad condition or have a low Karnofsky status. I think that's very important. So I really look forward when you will go back to the clinic. <laughs> You can tell all your colleagues, because I think we use radiotherapy to patients do not have any benefit of it. And there's a question in the in the chat also about um, when should radiotherapy or bone metastasis be applied? Should that be a treatment for hospice patients? Do you have a short comment to that? That's, that's always difficult and it's also difficult sometimes to, to predict how long patients are going to live uh, and actually we saw in our study that 93 patients actually died before eight weeks after radiotherapy. Uh, we thought that was a quite a short time uh, but I've discussed these findings with my colleagues uh, at the palliative department and for some patients uh, it's also that radiotherapy can be beneficial although they don't live for maybe more than a couple of uh, five, six, seven, eight weeks, it, it might uh, uh, reveal pain for a couple of weeks and it might reduce uh, the doses of opioids. So that, that's difficult to say, but, but you have to think before you plan radiotherapy. Thank you. Well, I'm delighted to say that Yvette has made it back. Um, so I think we just have time uh, to complete Yvette's presentation. Yvette, if you're ready for that, uh, and then that will take us straight into the break. Yes, and I'm, I'm very sorry, everyone. I was offline, and that's within the hospital. It's very strange to be offline here. So hopefully you can see my presentation. This is where I left off. Yeah, I see you knocking, uh, nodding, uh, Mike. Um, Please continue. Yeah. yeah. So, um, the Dutch studies, I was telling you about the uh, or original study, the, the, the study with almost 1,200 patients. We had a lot of publications from this uh, study and I will only show you uh, this slide because I think this uh, uh, shows the most important uh, outcome uh, of the Dutch study, but also of all the other studies that have been performed on um, the fractionation issue. If you uh, if a single a fraction of 8 gray is uh, enough or if you should give more fractions and uh, if you look all the way down you see the uh, the diamond and um, uh, I, this proves that single fraction should be enough to uh, 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 to give to patients with bone pain so don't, don't give give any more please one of the other things that uh, Pauline Westhoff uh, um, did her PhD on was on quality of life and this slide shows you that patients who have less pain, so those are the ones responding, the ones with, uh, with the dark grey line, they also had uh, a better quality of life on a, level, on a number of domains. So this learns us that uh, it's not really necessary to ask your patients about all these quality of life questions and give them questionnaires, but if you ask them about their pain and pain is uh, diminishing, then probably the quality of life will improve uh, as well. So another study is a, a, a rather recent study, that's the Dutch uh, DEXA study, it was a study on dexamethasone for prevention of pain flare, it has been published in the Red Journal uh, only this year. Um, and what we did is we gave patients four times eight milligram dexamethasone or the second arm, one times eight milligram dexamethasone and then a placebo or uh, the third arm was four days of placebo. And there were no differences between uh, the dexamethasone for prevention of uh, pain flare. But what we did see, uh, and as you can see here, uh, is in the beginning on the, uh, uh, the pain score, is that, that the patients who had the four doses of uh, dexamethasone, they had a lower pain, um, a pain number um, during the days that they were on the dexamethasone. This, this shows us that dexamethasone is probably uh, good to lower the pain. And then after those days, they go back to the, the pain levels that the other patients who have the placebo have. 
we did this study in the Netherlands. There's a, a, a similar study performed in uh, Canada by the group of Edward Chow, um, and uh, there were no, uh, we had no differences between the dexamethasone. The Chow study was a positive study, but if you look at the percentages, it's very strange because they had lower numbers of uh, 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 pain flares compared in different arms than we have. So we think that you should not give standard pre-medication dexamethasone, but it does have an effect uh, on pain. So not, not standard. Another study is the PEEP study that was on pain education. So if you have patients who uh, are going to receive radiotherapy for their painful bone metastasis, if it is helpful to uh, to put a pain education by a, a trained nurse on top of the radiotherapy. And this study uh, had 350 the patients entered into the study and the patients were uh, were asked about their pain, about their uh, ideas about pain, and they had follow-up. The nurse called them after one week, four weeks, eight weeks, and 12 weeks. And what we saw is that a pain education of patients helps them uh, to lower their pain. They take in their pain medication and they have a lower pain score uh, earlier on uh, during the uh, period after the radiotherapy. Here you see the percentages. And this is another slide showing you that the nurse-led pain education lowered the pain score earlier than the uh, patients who did not have the uh, nurse-led pain education. Another study, the retreatment study, that was a large uh, international study performed by Edward Chow. Um, most of the patients were Canadian or Dutch. Also a lot of publications. This was a study on the effectiveness of retreatment. Uh, just one slide showing you that um, Re-responders have a better quality of life uh, if you look at all the domains. So again, if you have less pain, then you have a better quality of life. Then another study, it's a study on finite element modeling, looking at fracture prediction and looking at recalcification. Um, one of the uh, papers here is by um, Florike Eggermond. Uh, here you can see on the left side that if you give a little bit higher uh, radiotherapy, then you have a little bit more recalcification on the CT scan if you make CT scan up till 10 weeks. But um, it was a little bit strange on the right side that the plastic lesions had the, the most uh, um, a benefit of the radiotherapy, whereas we thought that the lytic ones should fill in. So this was not a uh, a very positive study, but perhaps the time frame was too short. It was only t 10 weeks. Maybe we should go to 12 weeks or maybe uh, four months to look at remineralization because clinically we know that it works. So another study on the second slide uh, with all the overview of all the studies is the present cohort. That is a large cohort from um, uh, my colleagues in uh, Utrecht University. It's an ongoing uh, cohort and within this cohort they can do uh, random randomization. They do a cohort multiple randomized uh, control trial design. And I will show you three of their uh, uh, papers. One of the papers um, that I uh, cooperated with was on pain response after stereotactic body radiotherapy. They randomized patients between um, a single dose of 18 gray versus a single dose of 8 gray. And there were no differences in pain response, not after three months um, and also not during those three months. So this is a negative trial on um, the idea that you should give higher doses with stereotactic radiotherapy to treat pain. Uh, another study by them was the BLEND study, it was a combination of radiotherapy and stabilizing surgery for patients with spinal metastasis. And this was kind of a, a proof of concept. On um, day one, they gave uh, uh, the high dose stereotactic radiotherapy to um, spinal metastasis. And on the second day, the orthopedic surgeon performed stabilizing surgery. Uh, in that way, uh, preventing the um, spinal metastasis from collapsing and initiating good pain relief. And they have moved on to a phase uh, um, three trial now. And then the third study that they um, performed was an oligometastatic uh, disease, uh, conventional versus stereostatic, again, 8 gray or 18 gray. And here you can see if you have oligometastatic disease and then you look at the pain scores, there's also no difference between higher dose or a lower dose. So I conclude that we have a lot of Dutch studies. We have multiple outcomes. There's a lot more. Um, and um, I think close collaboration is key. Thank you. 
Yeah, Ned, thank you very much. We're very pleased that you could make it back and complete uh, presentation of all that uh, interesting data. We're going to move to a break now for five minutes, um, and I would encourage you to return at 15.20 uh, for the panel discussion on how to plan and conduct studies. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome back, everybody, uh, to the panel discussion. Uh, my name is Gary Roden. I'm a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto and director of the Global Institute of Psychosocial and Palliative Care at the University of Toronto and director of cancer experience at the Princess Margaret Cancer Centre. And I'll be moderating this uh, panel with uh, Per Jogren, who I think uh, perhaps has been introduced already, but will speak as well and introduce himself. And uh, this panel, I think, is meant to consider the evidence we've heard, some of which confirms previous research, some of which challenges it, and to think about how this will inform future research, how we plan and conduct studies that take this into account, and paying attention particularly to the organization of palliative care, and particularly with regard to pain and end-of-life care. Uh, per, do you want to say a word or two before we turn to the panelists? Well, my name is Per Schuchlein. I have been introduced before. I'm from Copenhagen, a professor in palliative medicine, and uh, uh, we have had a, a very interesting day, I think, as Gary already uh, summed up, some very interesting studies, and I, and I think we should uh, immediately go to, to the panelists. Um, shall we start with Rag Nils uh, uh, first? Who, would you like to begin? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think uh, it's been a very interesting day as well. Um, when it comes to how to organize uh, studies and what are important for the future, and it, it's not as easy to answer. Uh, um, but but what I thought about uh, that is maybe the most important for us is to be best, best clinicians and find things that really interest us and have the support um, in in good palliative nurses and study personnel to actually be able to do those studies that we really uh, enjoy and like. And uh, I don't know how easy it is actually to. Um, <laughs> As Marianne and I, as Nina also asked, uh, have, have this, your study or my study had implications for the clinical practice? And, and uh, that, that's, uh, that's a bit challenging, I think. Uh, uh, I don't know if any of the other pal panel uh, uh, speakers have any suggestions or experience with that. Your question is whether uh, people have the clinical resources to deliver the interventions. Is that the question? If, if they have any experience uh, about how their clinical uh, research have been conducted in, in clinical pra practice, if they have any experience on, on that, what's what I thought? How to integrate the two, how to integrate yeah. research and clinical practice? Is no, that no, no. How, how, how um, how their findings in clinical uh, trials, uh, how they have managed to interpret uh, yeah. yeah. So it's, um, I can, it's Please. Camilla, I can, I can comment that on that a little bit um, from recent um, research in our center at the Princess Margaret uh, Cancer Center in, in Toronto. Um, so uh, we did show in our, in our trial and in many other trials that early palliative care um, improves quality of life. Um, but uh, we were wondering, actually, in our center, whether practices have changed, whether um, whether oncologists now do refer earlier um, to palliative care as a consequence of of these trials. So um, we did a, a sort of a before and after study, looking at uh, referral patterns before these trials were started um, in 2006, before any findings were out. And then uh, again in 2015, I looked at practice uh, practice patterns, and we did find a significant um, increase from 30% early to more than 50% um, being referred early, and that was without any name change. So we do know from the results of Eduardo Barrera's team that um, that uh, the name change uh, changed uh, practices, 
but uh, we were able to show that early palliative care, just the just the guidelines and the studies that have been um, been shown have actually changed practice patterns. So I, I do think at least in the um, in the uh, early palliative care realm that that some of what we're suggesting, at least in one study, um, has has changed practice uh, patterns. And again, Eduardo's group did a, a national survey of cancer centers in the U.S. and again found that there were more outpatient clinics and earlier referrals. So I think things are gradually changing, at least in in that realm. But maybe some other people have have um, uh, results from some of their uh, studies as well. Yeah, I can comment on that um, for the bone metastasis because when the trials on the single fraction came out, uh, we also looked at the, um, uh, the fractionation given afterwards. And in the Netherlands, you saw a sharp drop of the six times four gray, which was um, the uh, standard before the Dutch trial, and it moved on to a single fraction of eight gray afterwards. Um, and um, in th there have been done some studies also published on uh, case cases uh, on which uh, how many doses you should give there. And it's international uh, study uh, looking at uh, Canada, at the US, at Europe, at other countries, uh, showing that the uh, percentages of a single fraction went up after a lot of the studies uh, came through in the, uh, in the late 90s and the beginning of 2000. So I think it's important to to keep showing that and to keep trying to uh, to get a feel on how it changes our practice. Because if it doesn't change our practice, then we have to uh, uh, keep on telling uh, our colleagues that what we do has implications for our patients, whether it's a palliative care uh, consultation team coming in or whether it's for the radiotherapy community giving just a single dose which is excellent so there's consensus maybe that evidence does seem to result in change although of course many other things are happening at the same time as evidence is being collected maybe the development of clinical services um, a lot of advocacy and I don't know if people have comments about this, but maybe it's more in some parts of the world than the other than others. Do you think that that, for example, is this more high income uh, country phenomena, or do you think we've changed practice as well in lower and middle income countries? So I, I mean, I, I think all the studies have been in high income countries. So I think it would make sense uh, that um, the practice changes mainly in the in the kind of a setting. Uh, in the healthcare setting that that the studies took place, um, I think we need more studies um, in in a low middle and low income countries. I think uh, Mary Fallon's study was fantastic, where she was um, able to uh, recruit uh, patients in in Africa as well as Mexico. Um, and I think the early need this as well. Um, so, because right now, I think uh, people in, in lower and middle income countries could quite rightly say, well, you know, the evidence isn't for, for our setting. Um, and, and there's many practicalities, obviously, uh, to, to doing something in a, um, a lower income setting that uh, compared to a higher income setting. And also different, different um, uh, healthcare systems and different practices. I was, I was, um, uh, interested from Chris's presentation, um, there's a lot more, and, and we know that in the Netherlands, a lot more involvement of, of uh, GPs and of primary uh, palliative care uh, than there is um, in, in other settings, um, in, such as the US and in, in Canada, um, where it's more a specialized model, mm -hmm. uh, at least in cancer centers. So, um, so I think, um, and I don't know, Pierre, if you have any comments about that as well. Yeah, I, I, I would like to, to return to you in a moment, but I think we should uh, to give the word to our uh, last uh, panelist, uh, Evelyn Kuip from, from the Netherlands. Could you please present yourself and, and put some words uh, uh, on this discussion, please? I, I will yes, return I will to Camilla that. later. Yeah. Um, I'm Evelyn Kuip. I'm one uh, of the oncologists in the Radboud Medical Center in Nijmegen. Um, and I'm also working in the team uh, of Chris uh, as a palliative care consultant. Um, 
I want to make a point also about education about palliative care because uh, we see that a lot of more uh, attention to education is in the um, uh, medical school but also in the um, uh, education for um, uh, internal medicine specialists so that we see that also a lot of asking for consultation is also from the young doctor and they are also really interested in uh, palliative care and also know uh, already a lot about research in palliative care, um, so um, I think that's also a change in palliative care uh, consultations we do. Mm -hmm. I have a question for the panelists, which is more about the conduct of studies, and it's sort of a, a, a two-pronged question. One is about the nature of the intervention, you know, there's variability sometimes in the results of research on early palliative care, and I wonder to what extent uh, when one group uh, does, for example, reports a team-based intervention, for example, in early palliative care, whether that intervention is actually the same intervention, how much comparability, how much standardization or comparability is there so that we know if we're comparing the same thing or apples and oranges. And the related question is about outcome measurements. Uh, one of the things that's always uh, surprised me uh, in the outcome studies in early palliative care is that uh, we haven't seen as much, or maybe you have a comment about this, but my impression is we haven't seen as much effect on physical symptoms, pain and other physical symptoms, compared to quality of life, satisfaction of care and other outcomes. I don't know if people agree with that or not, but if it is, is this a measurement problem? Uh, um, or or um, what might we attribute these, these kind of findings to? If I uh, try to answer it from the bomatesis uh, uh, issue, I think we had the same problem there. A lot of studies, a lot of a pain measurements, a lot of quality of life, and all went went through each other, so it was not the same. And then in 2000, we uh, together, Collaboration International, made the bone consensus uh, uh, document on how to perform studies. And of course, I think it's easier if you look at bone metastasis, radiotherapy, and pain and quality of life, than if you look at the, the, the patient with cancer and the, um, uh, the palliative care team uh, involvement, but you should go to something like that for the community. So try to have consensus meetings, maybe using Delphi or uh, in the an international group, and then uh, how you can conduct studies on the effect of uh, uh, involvement of palliative care teams. And in the same way, look at follow-up, look at quality of life, look at pain, uh, all the symptoms that you uh, mentioned, Gary. Thank you. Just a short comment, uh, Yvette. Uh, I have used that page, uh, paper on uh, a consensus of, of how to do trials on radiotherapy a lot while, while planning our study, and it was really, really helpful. Uh, and it's so good because now you can see that some of the new studies, they are more similar than the old ones. So I totally agree with you that consensus papers are, are really, uh, really good. Camilla, if you were to think about how we might take things a step further in terms of improving the rigor of, of some of the palliative care studies or research in the field around the interventions, around measurement or other methodological suggestions, any comment about that? Well, I mean, just a, a comment on your your, uh, your uh, earlier question about complex interventions. I, I think we do now have evidence from many different um, settings in, in America and Canada um, and several European uh, countries um, in different health care systems. I think what's important in complex interventions is that you keep the, uh, make it clear what the core intervention is that everybody has to receive and then what the ancillary interventions are um, that are optional. So for our study, for example, everybody saw a physician and a nurse and some people saw a social worker, some people were referred to home care, some people received palliative care in the palliative care unit. But, um, but there were certain things that were kept consistent, and I think the um, the successful uh, interventions have have all done that. With respect to your uh, comment on on um, physical symptoms, I think the problem in a lot of these early palliative care studies is that the symptoms were not um, were not so severe because it was an early palliative care intervention, and because it was done for absolutely everybody. Um, at diagnosis, regardless of whether people had physical symptoms or not, um, everybody has, uh, well, most people have difficulties with emotional symptoms when they're first diagnosed, 
um, and just from the shock of being diagnosed with a new advanced cancer, but not everybody necessarily has physical symptoms. So I think that's why the, uh, the uh, influence on depression and on emotional symptoms was higher than on physical uh, uh, symptoms. So there were, there were studies uh, such as ours showing an effect on physical symptoms as well, but those effects occurred later, I think, because um, the physical symptoms tend to occur later. I'm very much uh, in agreement with, with, with you, Camilla, about, uh, because if you look at the trials, uh, the, the RCTs we have now in, in cancer, uh, it's only a few of them who have uh, measured physical symptoms uh, positively, so to speak. Uh, but I think also um, we, could, we could discuss a little bit how many of the RCTs is really implemented. Uh, we, we, we made two Danish ones and, and I don't think they, they, they will be implemented. Maybe parts of it will be implemented and that's also very good. But as you said yourself, when, when, when your uh, interventions or your studies have changed practice in, in, in your environment, uh, you also have a strain on, on the resources in palliative care because they come earlier. Uh, and you may not have the right patients referred and, and so on. You, you, gave, you gave some of these issues in, in your talk. Could you comment a little bit on that? Because the mm -hmm. implementation, implementation, in, implementation uh, uh, gives new problems, so to speak. Yeah, I, I agree with you. So all of the studies so far, um, actually with the exception of yours actually, uh, which, which did the DAMPAC study, which did, um, uh, you know, um, uh, um, upon, uh, as an enrollment criterion, um, people had to have a certain amount of, of, of symptoms. Um, but most trials uh, accept, accepted patients no matter what, and, um, and across the line, everybody got the intervention. So, and I, and I don't think that that's practicable. Um, we certainly could not see absolutely every uh, patient with advanced cancer in our, in our cancer center. And I think the next questions that do need to be answered are uh, which which are the patients that that benefit? What is the cutoff? Um, I, what are the kinds of things that that we should cut off on? The, the, our study uses symptoms, as some people have said in the uh, in the chat. There may be other things as well. It's just that we happen to screen for symptoms already in our cancer center, um, so we're using the screening system that already exists. Many uh, cancers. It's actually mandatory in Ontario, the province of Canada that I live in mandatory for all cancer centers to screen for symptoms. Um, and this is uh, becoming a more prominent thing even during COVID. Um, you can screen for symptoms at home um, and that's increasingly being done through apps. So, um, so we chose to, chose to screen for symptoms um, because that's widely done and used already and, and, um, and we thought it would be uh, good to use something that's already being done in standard practice and then use that as a sort of a triage mechanism. But I, I agree with you, that's the next question is who, who actually should receive this intervention because not everybody uh, will be able to receive it. And also involving um, GPs and primary care in a better way uh, earlier on in the uh, disease course. I think that's something that we don't do well enough and, and need improvement on. Other comments from the panelists? I mean, what I take from some of this is that uh, we need to pay attention to the phase in which we're seeing patients and the outcomes might be different at early versus later. That, as Camille was saying, maybe psychological outcomes are important or more prominent earlier and physical symptoms we know tend to grow uh, with greater proximity to the end of life. Uh, I do think we think about standardizing the intervention. So if psychological outcomes are the major intervention, I think we need to think more closely about what are the psychological interventions. What is it that palliative care teams or the, the core or ancillary um, services are doing to influence psychological outcomes and how can we standardize those, evaluate and train people in those more effectively would be one question. Um, uh, but it's encouraging to think that evidence has made the difference. Uh, but I, I think as there's kind of agreement that it's made a difference more in our parts of the world. And evidence alone is probably not enough in lower income countries that we need to provide more support and more advocacy probably for change to occur in those sectors as in other areas of medicine. Paris, I don't know if you have a last comment. I think our time is going to be up shortly or if any of the panelists have a last comment. Uh, 
No, I think we, we have to, to close this uh, panel session. Thank you for participating in it and thank you to the audience uh, to listen to us for this discussion. It was a very interesting discussion and I think we have to give the word now to, to Tonya to, to finalize this day. Please. So this day has now come to an end and I would like to thank all attendees, presenters, chairs and moderators for being with us today. I hope you've enjoyed the session and we are looking forward to see you all tomorrow. Have a nice evening.